Hello, my friends. Welcome back to another Oxygen Not Included tutorial. And I just have to say, for those of you following this channel and waiting for more playthrough videos of some of my runs, uh, it's been kind of a long time since I've been back, since I've been moving and building a new PC and stuff like that, but should be back on it here pretty soon. But in the meantime, let's talk about one of the most complicated parts of this game and one of the most essential parts of this game, and that is power. Um, what you're looking at right now is what most of my bases look like towards the end once my power room is all fleshed out and you can see it looks quite complicated. Um, there's usually even some stuff up in space to get power as well such as these solar panels and this tutorial is going to be all about how to generate that power from a whole bunch of different sources, all the ins and outs of those different sources as my computer hitches. And uh, yeah this will probably be a very very long video so what I've been trying to do in my tutorial videos is down at the bottom putting them into chapters. So if there's a particular portion of power that you're interested in learning, you can just scan through the chapters and see which ones you want to watch. But I'm just going to go through them all, and it's going to take me a, a while to do all this. So this is definitely going to put the mega tutorial to the test in terms of how mega this can possibly be. So I'm expecting this to be long. Stick around if you want to learn a lot about all types of different power. But yeah, let's go ahead and get started with some basics. Okay, here we go. Let's get started by talking about some basics of power. And this is mostly going to be like general concepts of it, and we're going to get into builds and stuff later. So let's just go through this section real quick, because I think this section is really fundamental before actually talking about some of these builds, and it'll kind of set up what we're doing in some of the other ones. So the first thing I want to talk about is, uh, this is going to be a little bit counterintuitive to start off with, but the first thing I want, to, want you to be thinking about is not necessarily how you're going to generate the most power, but how you're going to conserve power too. Um, so power con conservation is a really big deal. And we'll look at two different setups that are doing the exact same job, just with slightly modified uh, setups, uh, just to demonstrate that there's a bunch of different ways to always solve the same problems. And one of the goals you should be trying to do with some of these is making sure that you're conserving power while you're setting these up or while you're running them. So. The job that I want done here is I want these gases that are in here to be filtered into four different compartments. So I want this to only be one gas, I want this to only be another gas, I want this to only be another gas, and so on. Uh, this is going to sort of resemble something that will be in your base, where your base could have a bunch of gases floating around it, uh, such as oxygen, natural gas, carbon dioxide, and chlorine and you're probably going to have some kind of ventilation system in there at some point and you'll need to filter those gases and send them to different places for example you'll want to burn the natural gas for energy chlorine you might want to store you might want to get rid of or whatever same with the carbon dioxide oxygen you obviously want to keep so uh, i'm going to show you two different methods and demonstrate why power conservation is such a big deal so i basically have two pumps that are filled in this room that has a bunch of mixed gases on the left side, I have them all passing through gas filters. So you can see the wiring here. The general flow of the gas is it's going to go through this one, and then this one, and then this one if it needs to be filtered. And it'll send everything to the, their different places. Um, so that's what this setup is. On the right, we're doing the exact same thing, except for we are just using different tools to do the exact same thing. And that is by using a combination of this element sensor, which is going to detect a certain type of gas and it's going to activate uh, gas shutoffs here if it detects the, temp the, the temperature, if it detects the gas that we want to send into a certain room. So these are both fundamentally doing the exact same thing, but if you look at the power differences for one, you can automatically see that the left side is going to be comp consuming a ton more than the right side, and it's even more than it actually looks. So we'll take a look at how dramatic this difference is, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to destroy the power generator that was feeding these batteries, and let's see which side runs out of power first uh, once I turn these things on. So here we go. So we're going to pump all this out. Let's look at the pipes so we can see what's going on. We have a big hodgepodge of gases coming through these pipes, and these, this section of, uh, of the build for either one of them is just going to be to filter it and send it to the right place. So can see in this one uh, there should be something that eventually comes down here oxygen yep there we go this one's filtering for natural gas carbon dioxide's coming down here and chlorine down here so there you go and the same thing on the other side so there's a pipe for natural gas pipe for chlorine pipe for oxygen and a pipe for carbon dioxide 
So let's see which one runs out of power first, and this should be pretty obvious by now which one was going to run out of power first, because these are consuming way more power than this setup is. And it's to the point that I'll just wait as soon as this runs out of power, we can see what the actual difference is between the two. So, I have these on, on separate power grids, by the way, so they are not contributing to the power consumption. But if you look at the difference between these two, let's look how much is left. 19.5 kilojoules out of 20. That means that over 97% of the power is still left in this one. And this one has nothing. Meaning that this is doing an insanely more efficient job at filtering these gases. They both sucked out the same amount of gas. They both sorted the same amount of gas. But the amount of power savings we have over here is just absurd. So I want you to just take this point of advice as more of a general thought and see where you can get power savings by not consuming as much power to do the exact same jobs that you might need to do throughout the base. And this could be for things as minor as like food storage or things as major as like oxygen production or ventilation like we saw here or even as major as like cooling water for your bristle blossoms. So there's a bunch of different things you could do to save power and I just wanted to use this to demonstrate I'll just leave this running and this will probably clean out this entire room full of gases before this runs out of battery. So we'll come and check on this in just a second. But yeah, just showing that the same setup or same idea with different tools can sometimes save you a ton of power. Let's take a look at this setup now. Uh, this time we're going to be talking about using these smart batteries. Smart batteries were something I just showed here a second ago. They weren't hooked up, but yeah, there's not really much of a reason to build anything other than smart batteries once you actually have the metal for it. But what I'm going to be demonstrating here is how the smart batteries actually work. So smart batteries, there are two things in one. They can store your power, obviously. But the second is that they can control machines that are hooked up to them and tell them when to turn on or off. So for example, um, this coal generator, if it's not hooked up to a smart battery or anything like that, there is no automation cable that's linked between the two of them. This coal generator will run forever. Nothing will ever stop it, meaning that even when this is full, uh, we're still going to run the generator, which is just going to burn through resources. So this whole section is just going to talk about conserving resources that you're going to use to generate power. What I'm going to do on either side is I'm going to destroy the actual generators for these two things. And these lights down here are just going to waste power. So can see the power available is dwindling for both of them because they don't have coal right now. So let's go ahead and spawn in some coal. There we go. As it lags a little bit, we are good. Spawn in a few blobs of coal here. Let's go ahead and do our handy dandy cheats and dig them out. And then let's spawn a couple of duplicates on either side. Actually, no, I have auto sweepers here, which you don't necessarily have to do. But the point is that it'll just run by itself. So let's go ahead and throw these two in here, and as soon as it detects that it needs anything, which is going to be determined by either the percentage on here, or the uh, the numbers on the actual smart battery is when these things are going to get loaded. So we could probably add a little bit more power consumers in here if we wanted to really speed this up. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to delete these just for the sake of, of the video. So we go ahead and drop these back in here really fast. Now we have empty batteries, which is going to require us to actually load some coal. So we'll just go ahead and spawn some duplicates instead of using these auto sweepers. There we go. And then when the duplicates detect that you need to bring coal in here, they're going to do so. So what's going to happen is since they're both so low, they're going to start generating power here. And they should be generating them pretty equally. So on the right, we have our smart battery here. And we can set our settings here to tell the smart battery when to turn on and off, depending on how much power it has stored. So right now, this is going to be set to turn off when the battery is at 80% and turn back on when the battery falls down to 20%. So we can go ahead and run this. Now the problem with this, you should already be able to see, is that coal is a not infinite resource. You're eventually going to run out of coal. This one's going to stop once the battery is full enough. And all we have to do is just hook up an automation cable between the two of them. It's not very fancy at all. This one, however, is just going to continue to burn coal. And this means that if we did it this way, uh, this one would just be wasting coal right now. We're not getting any added benefit. We're doing the exact same job on both sides. We're just running some lights. The problem is that on this left side, we're just wasting coal to do this. Whereas the right side, hooked up to a smart battery, we're not using coal unless we absolutely have to. And this is going to, over time, consume a lot less coal on this side than this side because we're using the smart battery. So. Just wanted to demonstrate that smart batteries are very worthwhile. 
As soon as you have the opportunity to use them, you should use them and basically nothing else. There's not really a reason to use anything else other than them. Let me delete these two, and we'll move on. So now I wanted to talk about something you're going to see in a lot of my bases, and that's you're, you're going to have like a room that looks something like this, that eventually gets filled up with a whole bunch of different power sources. And I just wanted to talk really quickly about how to run cabling for all of those things, for different uh, power types. They're all going to be using one of two or maybe three different types of cables, and I'll explain why we'd want to do it that way. So one of the first things you're going to get is you're going to get coal power. So let's go ahead and set something like that up. So we need to start off with a smart battery, because once we have those, we should just be using those every time. We'll set up a handful of coal generators like that. And now we need to hook the two together. I'm going to hook this up with heavy watt wire, and I'm going to do this as soon as I have access to it in a normal run. So I'm going to hook this up with heavy watt wire. Now the problem is that I don't want to hook everything up to this heavy watt wire, so I need to transform it down to one of these smaller wire types. You'll notice in a lot of these other places I'm using these smaller wire types and not the heavy watt wire. It's partially because the heavy watt wire can be pretty expensive. It's really ugly. Your dopes don't like actually to see it. Um, and also, uh, it's not very good if you want to preserve um, temperature between rooms. So I will use the heavy watt wire just to connect any of the major power generators and anything that generally lives in a room like this that's near my power generators. Outside of that, I will transform it down. So let's go ahead and run some cable for that really fast. I'll do something like this towards the top of the room and again towards the bottom of the room so that I can distribute it out to my base. Let's do something like this. Now the two different types of transformers that you can have are these smaller transformers and the bigger transformers. The biggest difference between these two and the way that I like to remember it is that the smaller one supports these smaller wires like this and the bigger one supports the bigger wires that kind of go through walls still, this conductive wire. So what I will typically do for each of these is whenever I set these up is I will run uh, a cable that just to the left of it and then I will just run a bridge over the heavy watt wire so that I can now distribute it freely out into my base like that. And same thing with this wire. Now what you might ask is well what's the difference between these two smaller wire types? And really the only difference well, there's two, really. One of them uses refined metal and one doesn't. And the one that uses refined metal can handle a larger load on it. And this is important because there are some buildings in the game that you just literally can't run with this regular wire. It will overload the wire. And I'll show you an example of that really fast. Let's take a look at our utilities and an aqua tuner. So if you look at the aqua tuner on the overlay here, it's going to require 1,200 watts. Uh, and that's that's a significant amount only because that is more than this wire can actually handle. So if I were just to hook this straight up, this wire would start to break because there is too much power coming across this line in order to feed this aqua tuner. So I will typically get onto this conductive wire as soon as I can and start refining metal so that I don't have to build a bunch of wire like this and then go back and replace it later. So yeah, uh, basic cabling for power is going to look something like this. Let's talk about when you get more than one power source. So typically what you'll want to do is obviously hook up your automation cable to your smart batteries. I typically start off by setting everything to about 80-20. And then if I were to add a new power type, I'm actually going to add a second smart battery and hook these networks up independently when it comes to the automation. So I'm going to put some natural gas generators down like that, because that will typically be the next power type that you'll get access to. We'll hook it up to the same power line. We want them all to be on the same heavy watt wire. But when I hook up the automation here, I'm going to set this to be potentially something different. I might want to use natural gas before I start using coal. So I might have this stay on for longer, meaning that my high threshold is going to be higher. And I might want to turn it off, or sorry, I might want to turn it on earlier uh, when it's time to turn it back on. So I might set this to a little bit higher than, than the coal. Maybe have this on 80-20, maybe have this on 90-30. That's going to be the same thing for oil as well. I'm going to do the same thing for oil, and then there's going to be some stuff down here to kind of help vacuum out the room in case I get a bunch of carbon dioxide or collect water since uh, stuff like this, like this natural gas generator, will be producing water. We'll talk about those details a little bit here in these future sections. Um, I don't want to get too intimate with them right now, but I did want to mention uh, how to wire some of this stuff up in a base that, so that you can grow it out and you won't have to be constantly fighting for space and fighting for ways to expand this out. 
I usually just plan out a room that's a little bit bigger than this actually, probably goes down to about here and maybe out to here. That's just full of all of my major power generators, and if you were to notice in that first section, I did actually show one in my base that was already running. So, yeah, that's what I just wanted to start off with. In this next section, we're just going to go straight into builds. We're going to start off with the very simple builds like manual generators, uh, coal and natural gas, more complicated stuff like petroleum and like solar and steam and all that kind of stuff. That'll come in a later section, but uh, yeah, this video should be quite long. So uh, let's jump into that next section and keep it going. All right, next segment, we will talk about uh, producing builds, and this is gonna be the more basic of the power setup. So we're gonna cover manual power, we're gonna cover coal, and we're gonna cover natural gas, which you legitimately could win a game with those. It'd be pretty difficult on a lot of maps, but you could do it. Let's talk about those really fast. So the first and, whoops, really obvious one is uh, manual generator. This is the easiest one. All you have to do is plop this down, just got to connect it to whatever things you want to power. Usually I will only have regular wire by the phase in the game in which I'm going to be using this, unless I'm doing a very silly run, which I'm in the progress of right now, where I'm only on manual power. But yeah, most of the time it's just going to be a regular setup like this. And in all these I'm going to have like a bottom room that's just like an energy wasting type of room, just to prove out that, uh, you know, things are going to be sucking power down and you're going to need to refill it with something. So. Let me go ahead and spawn a duplicate in here. They're going to want to go and run on the generator right away just to fill this battery. The mechanics of how this actually works, this uh, this is a classified as a uh, operating job. So if you want to have somebody that's dedicated to it, you can set that up in the priorities to make them want to do that. You can also change the threshold in which they will come back and be attracted to doing this job again, depending on what the battery recharge threshold is set to. So this is kind of similar to the smart battery stuff I was talking about before, but this is mainly like, this will only advertise for a task for a duplicate to do if it's at that threshold. Otherwise, they'll just sit there. So if I want them to get right back on at like 75%, then once the battery falls below 75%, they will jump back on and do that job again. So really straightforward setup here, nothing too crazy. Usually when you're starting off the game, one of your first maybe five dupes, one of them should be dedicated to be somebody that wants to go back and do these jobs pretty frequently. So yeah, that's how that works. Let me just go ahead and destroy this so that we don't have to care about Meep getting hungry or need to use the bathroom later or something like that. So yeah, pretty standard setup for manual generators. Let's talk about coal now. So coal has a little bit more nuance to it. Um, and I don't remember every single chamber that I had for this. So this might be a little bit of a mess, but uh, the first thing that you want to think about here with coal is Again, consider using a smart battery. Um, you might not necessarily need it at this phase of the game, but I like to get that research cranked out as fast as I can because the smart battery is very useful once you start getting any sort of uh, power generation that requires regular resources. So for coal generators, um, again, very simple. Just connect up an automation wire to the smart battery. That'll mean that this is only going to turn on and off between whatever numbers you set. So I'm going to set this to like 80-20, which is pretty standard for me meaning that if the battery ever falls below 20, this will turn on. But if it goes 80 or above, it'll turn off. Pretty standard. For my power setup, I usually do actually set this up with heavy watt wire by this phase of the game. You don't have to right away, but I find it more comfortable to do that. And then obviously if we're on heavy watt wire, you want to transform it somewhere. So let's go ahead and drop that really fast. It's just going to look like, where is it? Here we go. Something like this. Go ahead and run the heavy watt wire there. And then like I talked about in the previous segment, if you wanted to ever ha send this out somewhere in your base, I will usually build a bridge, something like that, to get it over the bigger wire and then go up somewhere. Now with coal, this is the first point in which we're gonna need to worry about a resource that we actually have to use to generate power. Obviously that's gonna be coal, so you have to think about where you're gonna get that. Um, you can dig it out around the map but the more renewable way is to start branching hatches. So you do need to make sure you have the ranching research, which uh, I guess I feel like I should just go ahead and show. It's gonna be in here, right here. You wanna get this ranching research so that you can start ranching hatches to produce coal for you. They can eat a whole bunch of different things. Uh, the biggest thing I wanna feed them is sedimentary rock. I've talked about it a couple of times, what's good and bad to feed them. So I'll cover it here again after I get this all set up. So in order to ranch, you need one of these grooming stations. 
you need something to actually bring them there so you can like capture them. So you need a critter drop off and you need a critter feeder. So the once you actually do get hatches, let's say they're walking around the map here. Let me actually spawn a dupe and just give them the skills so we can see this whole thing play out here. What's up, Bert? So let me go ahead and spawn a hatch. We want a full-grown hatch, one of these. You may see these things walking around the map. That's going to be what's going to be what, going to be producing coal for you. And I think we have this set so that I can just give Bert the skills that we need. So you definitely need ranching at minimum before they can start wrangling. The next one is just going to make them a little bit better, but you probably want to research that anyway. So, oh, we gave it to Gene. Whoops. Gene's my, like, corner uh, dupe over there just to make it not give you the message of the colony was lost because I find that really distracting. So what you want to do is you have the, one of these hatches. You've got your uh, duplicate here that has the skill in order to ranch. So if you do something like this... We need to set where this actually goes, so we're going to go ahead and set it for hatches and probably hatchlings. The amount of space it can go in here, uh, you can look that up, but you can kind of also just fill it out. I'll just say two or three for the time being, because this is a really small room. Actually, it might just be two. It's pretty small. So you got to set that up, and then once you actually give the errand to capture, your dupe will run down there, they'll grab the hatch, and they'll move them up to this room, which you can see like so. Once they actually get in there, that's going to be when you're going to need to start bringing food to them, and that's what this critter feeder is for. As we see Bert coming up here, dropping off the hatch, and there you go. Now you got it in the room. If your uh, station is in here and you have a dupe that's capable of ranching, they will come and groom this hatch so that they produce coal faster. The feeder is something that we need to actually specify what we're going to be giving these guys, so there's a whole bunch of different things these hatches can eat. Um, I really would encourage you to restrict this down to just a few things. There's a whole bunch of stuff you do not want to feed them. You don't ever want to feed them sand. Feeding them dirt is pretty bad too. Uh, the best things that I usually feed them are sedimentary rock or any sort of metal ores if you want to start producing the other types of hatches, which I'll cover in another video. But for right now, sedimentary rock is definitely one of the safest things to feed them. So I'll go ahead and set that. Now dupes will start running sedimentary rock from wherever on the map. There's just piles of it here into there. This hatch will eat and eventually it will poop out a little bit of coal which then my duplicate can take down and load into our power generators. So let's go ahead and set these up and we also need some power requesters so I'll just do something really really silly just to waste some power. You don't have to do this but we'll just put a bunch of lights in here for whatever reason. No real reason to do this other than to waste power so don't get any impression that this is what you should be doing. So, now that we have something requesting for power, and uh, our dupe has filled up this critter feeder, the next thing they should want to do is take uh, coal down to these guys. So, we definitely do want to encourage them to bring coal. You can always increase the priority if you need them to bring more. So we'll go ahead and do that. And he's going to grab the coal, and he's going to bring it down here and load it in. Now that you have the coal, you're generating power, and then you can see by all these lights. So, there you go. Pretty straightforward setup here for coal power. Um, eventually you can start shipping the coal out, uh, and I covered this a little bit in my shipping tutorial, and this is going to be a pretty common theme. But if you ever want to ship stuff out, you just need uh, an auto sweeper, a conveyor loader, you need some rails to come down here, and drop it off to the place you want it to get to, and then the auto sweeper can load it into the nearby areas. I'm not going to cover this in too much detail, but later in the game that's probably what your setups will look like. You can also potentially even eliminate this critter feeder so that you don't have to have dupes running it manually. But yeah, pretty straight, pretty straightforward setup here for coal. One other thing I'm going to mention is a setup to get rid of the byproducts this produces. So this will produce carbon dioxide. It's not a ton, but it is. Uh, it's definitely there. So I will usually grab one of these pumps and I will set it on some kind of automation to pump out the carbon dioxide when I don't want it. So I usually do something like this where I can find it. I'll usually set up a gas element sensor to sense for any elements that I basically don't want. So I want to, I'm going to set this up with a not gate and with a buffer gate. Again, this is all in my automation video, so if you need more information about what exactly this does, then go ahead and check that out. But the basics are, I want to get rid of every gas from here that is not oxygen. So I'm going to set this up for oxygen, it goes through a not gate. If I ever detect it, it's going to stay on for a little while. Uh, actually, I think I usually do this with a filter gate. My bad. Filter gate. Here we go. 
And the filter gate's there just to say, like, well, it has to be not oxygen for a certain amount of time before I allow this to turn on. I usually set this to be pretty high. And since this is usually right next to my power generators, I will just hook it up with this wire. And then we need to also set pipes to blow it out somewhere. Just pretend this goes out into space just because I don't want to have to run it all the way up there. But there you go. That's what a finished setup for coal basically looks like. You have something that's constantly producing uh, some, some fuel for this. You have uh, the gas pump that deals with any of these side effects. You have a source for food for the hatches. You have the skills to ranch your hatches, that kind of stuff. So this is pretty straightforward, pretty basic setup for coal power. Uh, even that far and beyond with the whole shipping part. So let's move on to the next power type that you're going to encounter and more than likely need to generate power from. Let me delete Bert because we don't need him anymore. And that's going to be natural gas. So what's going to happen is you're going to be digging around the map and occasionally you're going to see stuff buried behind rock and you're not necessarily going to see it. It's going to look a little bit more uh, hidden than this. It's probably going to look something like, you know, like this. So you might see a patch where you just see four of these neutronium blocks. You won't see this colony lacks field research skill. That won't be there. This is just there because I've uncovered it once before, but it kind of bugs it out. But you'll see something like this, and you'll want to go and see what this actually is. On your map will spawn usually quite a few natural gas geysers, and that's because they're a very powerful resource for power. One way you can tell what it is, you can go into your priority. You can select the top priority. You can select it if you know exactly where it is. And if you hover over this, it'll tell you what it is. It'll tell you it's a natural gas geyser. In that case, that means, okay, great. We can uh, uncover this and we can start harvesting it for power. So let's do that. I should have everything set up here. Oh, let's go ahead and set the priority back down to something else. I'll usually set it to seven to know that I have actually checked this to, so I don't know what it is and it's not something new. Even that I usually forget, but whatever. So, for these, let's talk about a basic setup to actually capture this. Um, you don't want to just... Whoa, whoops, we deleted the neutronium. Uh, <laughs> um, neutronium. Don't want to do that, because you can't actually do that in the real game. But yeah, so once you dig it out, it'll look something like this. You will want to be careful, though, and not just expose it like this. And that's because you'll have natural gas coming out at two or 302 degrees Fahrenheit. It is ridiculously hot. You don't want that just spilling into your base, causing a bunch of heat to go in there. You want to capture this and you want to use it in a very controlled manner. So a good build for this is going to be something like this. I would get to insulated tile. I will probably make this out of ceramic or I will make it out of uh, obsidian if I have access to either of those. Let's go ahead and go for obsidian here. And I'll build out something that looks kind of like this. Just a small room for this thing so that the natural gas isn't going to go anywhere. The obsidian insulated tiles here are just to prevent any heat transfer as much as possible so that we keep it nice and cool in our base while this can be super hot. And then as far as on the inside what you want there is you want a gas pump. Specifically you want a gas pump that's made out of steel and that's because that's one of the only materials that can actually resist the heat that comes out of this thing. 302 if you were to build this out of something else, like let's go ahead and just build one out of, let's say, copper, because that's one of the first things that you see, this can only resist up to 167. So you need to build it out of something that can actually resist the heat. So steel is definitely what we are going to want here. And like I talked about before, there is no reason not to put any automation on this just to prevent you from wasting power pumping this out, because you have to use power to pump this out. It's not really a great setup to... Uh, have it do anything else because you will eventually need to pump it to get it into one of the uh, the buildings that will generate power for that so pump is mandatory so let's set up some automation here like I talked about before it's just a simple Atmos sensor and a buffer gate we're gonna wire it up like so the logic here is that the Atmos sensor will only send an active signal if we are above 1500 grams is usually what I do then I set this on a buffer signal so that this thing isn't constantly throttling on and off. It'll stay on for a little while afterward. Set up to something like 10 seconds. So that means any time that our pressure is over 1500 grams, turn this pump on for 10 seconds and pump it somewhere that I can store it. So I also notably already have a lot of the wiring and piping done in here. So I'm already pumping it out here. And the wiring is just the conductive wire. You don't necessarily need a conductive wire here, but I want to do that because I'm going to totally seal this up. Once this is done, I'm not getting inside here ever again. So yeah, you're definitely going to want to do that. 
Also something to note is that there's a possibility that what comes down from here is, or is in here already is probably oxygen. So it's not the worst idea to just vacuum this out before you start pumping it somewhere because you don't want to filter this forever. You'd rather just vacuum it out once, then you'll know that the only thing that will ever exist in there is natural gas. So I've already gone ahead and done that because that's not a very interesting step. Just get it to the point where this gas pump is not immersed in gas and everything around it is a vacuum. You can also do that by just flipping this by saying, turn on if you're below 1500 grams or turn on if you're below 10,000 grams or something like that. Then once it's a vacuum, you can revert it back to its original settings. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, right now you will see that the natural gas geyser is not active. It's not erupting right now. That's because these erupt irregularly, just like all the other geysers and vents and volcanoes in the game. If you get to a point where you can actually analyze it, it will tell you, and this is going to do it automatically because I'm in like a cheater or sandbox mode right now. But if you analyze it, it'll eventually show up in this active period here so that you know when it's going to erupt. So this says it's going to erupt in about 80 seconds, so it'll give us enough time to talk about some other portions of this. But typically what I do with the natural gas setup is once I start pumping it out of here, I will pump it to some kind of storage area because you're not going to just actively burn through this. You want to save it in the event that you know, we talked about this earlier, you don't want to just waste resources. So I'm just going to pump this somewhere that I can store it. And there's two ways that I can do that. One of which is going to be in something like this, just a chamber with a high pressure gas vent. That'll allow me to put up to 20 kilograms per tile of natural gas in this area. And I can just store it in here until it's ready to be pumped out. This is the worst option from the standpoint of power consumption. But it's also the best option from the standpoint of metal usage. Uh, there's another way you can do this. Let me finish building out this uh, setup here really quickly. So I just probably do something like that. And then this pump would take it down to my power producers, which we'll build it here in just a second. Uh, these are, okay, yeah, we're good. So this is one way to do it. I do this a lot and it's often on maps where I'm not uh, very rich in metal. I, the, but the downside is I do have to wait for plastic, and the other downside is I am spending double the power in order to manage this. One is to get the gas in there, and one's to get the gas out. So that's not great. If you want to do it another way and you have metal to spare, you can do something like this. Uh, send it into gas reservoirs. And I know this is going to look funny because I already did the piping in advance. Piping is not super interesting to watch, but basically the idea with this piping is I'm going to pipe it from here and uh, just for the sake of it, I'm going to, let's just go ahead and just destroy this. We'll, we'll manage it another way. So I'm gonna pipe it from here all the way up into these tanks. And I just have a whole bunch of tanks here. You'll probably need even more than this on a real map. This can sometimes get up to like, you know, 30 tanks or so full of these things. And you also wanna isolate that in some kind of insulated tile. So I have ceramic here. I also had ceramic around this area, by the way, which I didn't mention because you're still storing super hot natural gas. So I don't want this to be overheating anything else. So, and then what you can do is you can send it in these tanks. These tanks also have outputs, which basically will fill up these pipes. And if something ever requests it, it'll just send it back out. So I just have a long string of pipes sending natural gas from here into these tanks, then a long string of pipes sending natural gas out of these tanks into whatever requests it, which we're gonna build down here in just a second. So now we've covered the basics of harvesting natural gas, which is this, and the basics of storing it, which is one of these two options. Uh, I would just pick one or the other. Uh, it doesn't really matter which one. The, there's obviously pros and cons to each of them. This one's going to come up a lot slower. It's not going to require plastic. It's going to require a lot more metal, that kind of stuff, but it is lesser energy. This one's kind of the lazy option of just like, whatever, I'm going to pay the extra power just to pump this back out. It's not a huge amount of power, but it still is significant over time. But yeah, you'll want to choose one of those two options. Whoops, I don't know what I just hit. E, apparently. Uh, so yeah, so let's talk about the actual natural gas setup itself. So this is going to look really familiar to something like this. Let's go ahead and build out a smart battery, which is going to be here. Let's build out our natural gas generators. I'll build just a couple. You can build a lot more than this if you have the natural gas to actually push it. Let's go ahead and hook up our automation wire like that. You can already see I do have power connected to here, so this is on a heavy watt wire. And the heavy watt wire will eventually go into a power transformer, a large power transformer. I'm more than likely on a large power transformers by this point. 
and on conductive wire by this point. So you can see it coming out here and powering this guy and this thing and some stuff down here. Uh, but yeah. Actually, I'm not going to do anything down here. I was just going to put in like a power wasting setup down here, but we'll just use the lights. I think that's a little bit better. So yeah, we have all this. Um, and it looks like we're pretty much set up, but we are forgetting a couple of things. One is when we send the natural gas out of our storage facility, it needs to actually go into the generator. So we'll go ahead and send it in there. And this also have exhaust, and that's because this also produces carbon dioxide, but uh, it produces it uh, via these pipes. It doesn't actually just spray it out into the air like the coal generators do. So this one's easy. You can just go ahead and hook these up to a pipe and just send the carbon dioxide wherever you want. I usually just blow it out into space. So we've got a big long pipe heading out into space and there you go. So this setup is pretty much complete. We are forgetting one thing though, and that is that the byproduct of this is also polluted water. So when you use natural gas, these things will emit polluted water and there's no pipe coming out of it for that. It'll just dump it on the ground. So typically what I will do is I will uh, just build the layers below this out of a mesh tile, which will allow for water flow. And it'll collect at the bottom of this area. Um, and I'll eventually have like a door or something like that to just dump it out somewhere. It's not a tremendous amount of polluted water, but it does add up over time. Honestly, a lot of it will gas off into polluted uh, oxygen. So something else you can do down here is you can set up something like this with a mesh tile and some deodorizers so that you just eventually will gas it off. Uh, it's not super fast and depending how much stuff in here you may still need to dump it out somewhere or something like that, but that's definitely an option. So yeah, this is a basic natural gas setup here. So that's looking pretty good. We've got our storage and everything. We just need to wait for this thing to erupt and we'll see the whole thing in action. One thing I don't have though is these batteries are not charged because uh, I don't have any power right now, and that's just a side effect from me doing this in the sandboxy mode. So let me go ahead and just hook up power really fast. There we go. Deconstruct that. So now we are starting with a full battery at least, and as soon as this erupts, and as soon as this produces enough natural gas to set off this Atmos sensor, uh, we will be able to see this whole thing in action. So let's just awkwardly wait for a little while. I could probably speed it up too. Okay, so here we go. So it's going to say rising pressure. Once it's actually emitting, it's going to emit out natural gas like this. This room is going to start filling up with natural gas, which you can see. Once we reach over that threshold of about 1,500 grams, you can lower it or maybe just by a little bit. The whole aim there, like we talked about, is you don't want this to be pumping out smaller uh, bits of natural gas. You'd rather pull out or have it pump out full packets, at least as much as this thing can push. There we go. There's natural gas coming out. It's going to be coming into our lines here. I'm going to ignore this part for right now. We'll talk about the tanks since they're more, uh, more intricate. So what happens with these tanks is it'll go into the first one. I've, I've wired it up this way so that it goes into a tank until it's totally full, then it goes to the next tank until it's totally full, and then the next tank until it's totally full, and so on. What happens is as soon as there's anything in this tank, if there is something requesting it, like a pipe, it'll immediately send it back down there and it'll send it back in to be used. So it's traveling down this pipe. It's going to make it into our power setup here in just a second. And once it gets there, it'll be pretty clear that it's there because these things will activate considering we are running out of power very badly. And there we go. Uh, now we should be getting, should be getting natural gas here. Oh, the smart battery wasn't set correctly. My fault. There we go. Now we're getting power. So these things are going to power up because the smart battery is set. Once we get to a certain amount, it's just going to turn it right back off. So there we go. We have a full loop on harvesting natural gas. And uh, here's the carbon dioxide that it produced, by the way, just being blown out into space. And there you go. And yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Um, this is going to sustain us for a little while in the sense that we're just going to keep collecting natural gas, even though we may not necessarily need to use it for anything. You can also see there is a little bit of a power overhead about uh, having this thing pumping out. So it's not overly significant, but it is a little bit of a drain, and that's why that automation is so important. But yeah, this is pretty much it for a natural gas setup. Um, I'm going to be doing the same thing for more advanced setups. That's going to include a whole bunch of stuff uh, that we haven't talked about yet. So if you just open this power tab, pretty much everything that's left in this power tab is going to be explained here in the next section. 
So let's jump into that really quickly, and then there will be a there will be a couple others. This video is going to be really long, but yeah, let's let's go ahead and get there. Okay, here we go in the section about more advanced builds. This is going to be all of the mid and later game power setups that you're going to need. Or maybe not necessarily need, because I did say you can win the game with just natural gas, manual, and coal. Uh, but it's going to be difficult. So let's talk about where my brain immediately says that we've transitioned into a later phase of the game. And that's when you start getting oil up. Uh, when I was a new player, this was the thing that really pushed me over the edge and got me into the later stages of the game that I'd never seen before. So let's talk about that. So I'm going to unpause this. We actually have some nice background music. But uh, what we're going to be dealing with here are these petroleum generators. So let's start off by just dropping some of those and then kind of work backwards to see what we need to support them. So we'll put down a couple here like this. So you can see these things are very, very powerful. They put out 2,000 watts when they are on, like I talked about before. We still want these to be on a smart battery, so let's go ahead and hook that up like we've done before. The automation cables are already run for me, so I've got those in there. Let's set up our values really quickly. Okay, so what we've got is petroleum generators, and they're going to expect some kind of combustible liquid. Uh, there's two different things you can feed to this. One is ethanol and one is petroleum. Uh, petroleum is by far a lot more common, and note they are named petroleum generators because these existed before ethanol even existed, so yeah, that's why that's what's up with that. So, okay, we need petroleum to these things, so let's work backwards from there. How do we get petroleum? Uh, we could go in here and we could say petroleum, how do we get this? Whoops, or if you gotta spell it correctly. Here we go. Uh, this is the thing that we need, and it says here it's refined from crude oil. So, okay, let's work backwards from there. Now we need crude oil. And where are we going to find that? Typically, the place you're going to find that is down towards the bottom of your map. So if you go all the way down to the bottom, I just have it simulated here, you're going to find biomes that look kind of like this. And they're going to be really hot, so notice the temperature that's in here. You definitely don't want to just open these up and be casual about letting this into your base. So. This is a whole process just to get down here and start exploring in this biome. So I'm going to kind of go through that build as well. Also, you may notice that down at the bottom there's going to be some magma. Um, that can be important for some setup like this, but for now we're going to ignore it and we're going to look at something involving magma a little bit later. So, okay, let's say that we want to enter the oil biome. And I always treat this as a little bit more of like a formal process than maybe other people do, just because I find this to be a very important transition point. So. What we'll want to do, let's pretend like this is an entrance to our base, like that, so that we have like oxygen in this area. Let me go ahead and delete some stuff here. So let's say this is our base, and we've built all the way down to here, and we are hitting the abyssal light that borders this. Um, the abyssal light is one of the best insulators in the game, so you definitely want to just leave this alone if you can. And you want to crack into the oil biome at just one set point, but you don't want to just go in. You need some way to actually prevent too much heat transfer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a overly complicated liquid lock here. I know there's uh, better ways to do this, but I just do it this way just to be clear, and just because I've gotten used to this way. So I'm going to set up some kind of liquid lock, and a liquid lock is basically going to prevent an exchange of gases from one side to the other. And notice I'm using all insulated tiles here. I want to minimize the heat transfer as much as possible. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up some kind of uh, liquid here. So I, let's just pretend we actually pumped this in for real and I didn't just uh, do this. But let's get some salt water, for example. You definitely don't want to use polluted water because that will just gas off. So I would say salt water is probably your best bet for a more common substance. Oh, whoops. We messed up. Let's brush in some vacuum here. Putting in too much salt water. I don't know why it defaults to that much, but there you go. All right, we don't want it to overflow. Let me delete a little bit here. There we go. So once you get your liquid lock all settled, you hopefully won't do it like I did and just spill it all over the ground. But once you get your liquid lock settled, now we can start setting up the suits to actually enter the other side. So I'm going to start setting up some stations here. We need an Atmos suit checkpoint right next to the area that we needed to go. The Atmos suit checkpoint will be expected to sit next to some of these Atmos suit docks. So I'm going to put a few here. I usually put like five or maybe even seven if I have a bigger colony. I'm just going to put a few for right now. These things will require a few things as well. They're going to require suits, of course, and you can forge those with the exosuit forge. Um, I'll let you go ahead and explore that part. I'm not going to get too far into how that works, but let's get some suits. There we go. 
These things also need power, so I'm just going to pretend that we have a power source that already works, and I'm just going to hook it up with one of these debug ones. We also need oxygen. Uh, we do need to pump oxygen into these docks so that they will fill the suits so your dupes can breathe down there. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to have an area full of oxygen. We're just going to pretend that we already have this in our base and that this isn't already weird. Let's just do something like this. Let's fill this with oxygen. This would hurry up. And let's just overpressurize this like crazy. There. So we have a lot of oxygen. We're going to get some ventilation going on. And we need this ventilation to run the pipes down into these Atmos suit stock like the Atmos suit docks like this. There. Now all we need is the suits. We're gonna ask for a suit delivery, and then as soon as we spawn a dupe there, we should be good. Let me sample this and put some oxygen in there so that dupe doesn't just die. And not oh, break their eardrums either, so here we go. So this is basically what it's gonna look like. You're gonna have some kind of breathable area next to your Atmos suit docks. You're gonna have salt water so that they can actually prevent any heat transfer so if there's any natural gas or carbon dioxide or whatever it doesn't actually uh, switch over to this side so this is going to be good let's go ahead and spawn a dupe here and they'll start doing the jobs that we have open for them oh i need to run power to my pump here so we can actually fill these suits with oxygen so once we have that i'm going to not actually use this dupe but this is what you're going to need to actually work down here i'm just going to work in the debug mode i just wanted to illustrate what it's like to have to enter this so once you start entering it, uh, let me make sure this is set correctly, yep. You're going to start digging down uh, a ladder, something like this. And maybe some, oh there's going to be, the debug mode doesn't uh, observe our digging, so let's just pretend that we dug this out. And I also like to put a fire pole just to help them get up and down a little bit quicker. Once you hit the bottom, which is going to be the abyssalite that separates between yourself and the magma that's down here, um, that's where you want to stop. You don't want to dig too much further into this because there's a good chance you're going to boil a bunch of this oil and potentially turn it into sour gas, which we're going to talk about a lot later and not in too much detail because that is like hyper advanced to the point that there's not really a need for that actually to win the game. I've never even had to build one of those before in a normal run, so yeah. So let's talk about what to build a pump down here to actually start pumping this crude oil out, which is going to be something like this. And by the way, if you find any other pockets of crude oil up there like that, you can always just dig up a ladder, kind of dig out something like that so that it starts flowing in here. And sometimes on some maps, this collection of crude oil will actually be enough to sustain you for the entire game. And that includes for rocket fuel and stuff like that too. So, uh, yeah. So let's go ahead and build a pump. Notice that's, that this crude oil is going to be kind of warm. Uh, sometimes it can get up into the 200s. Usually you can get away with just building something out of gold amalgam, and that'll be because the uh, temperature this thing can resist is 257 degrees Fahrenheit, or 125 Celsius. You can also build this out of uh, steel, though, if you're worried. You can go ahead and dig this out. We'll have something like this. We need to run power down there, so let's do that. And then we need to run some pipes uh, up, to our, uh, up to our actual area that we need to get oil to. So. There's two ways you can actually turn oil into petroleum, um, and that's the first thing we need to solve. One of which is a building that will just do it for you, or rather a dupe has to operate it, called this oiled refinery here. Um, this will refine it at a semi-inefficient rate, um, but still this is something that I will use in most of my runs. I will typically not boil the oil on purpose, only because it takes a little bit of extra setup and it's usually not necessary, but you can do it that way if you want, and we'll talk about that uh, later coming up here. So uh, for the oil refinery, let's go ahead and put that up somewhere near our generators. I'm going to put it right here since I already have a fancy place carved out for it. So obviously we need to get oil up here. Now what I don't want to do is I don't want to run a pipe that just goes from here all the way up into my base without any sort of like uh, blockages on it. I want to actually make sure that there's not oil sitting in pipes. So if I were to build something like this for oil, I don't want to have oil constantly sitting in these pipes because that'll eventually heat those pipes up and eventually heat my base up. And I don't want to do that. So I'm going to set up something a little bit fancier than that. You don't necessarily have to do it this way, but I don't want to encourage everybody to start overheating their base by sending oil up. So I'm going to use one of these, which is a liquid reservoir. I'm going to set it up like that. The liquid reservoir is just going to be to contain crude oil. This is going to be going into this oil refinery here. And I'm going to set this up on some automation so that we're requesting crude oil whenever uh, this is low enough. So I'm going to run a automation wire. 
down. Whoa, not through that. Down to our area down here. Going to run it over to something like this. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a liquid shutoff. It's going to go like this. And this shutoff is going to be to determine when we actually want oil out of here or not. So I'm going to run this up here into the inlet. The outlet's going to go out here. We're going to run all the way up to our base, and this pipe is usually going to be really long. And it'll run into here. So it'll eventually go into this liquid reservoir. So we have this reservoir that's basically saying, I need to tell you when I need more oil. So let's say we set it to something like, I don't know, 50, and the low down to maybe 20. Sure, whatever. So this is going to make sure that this tank is filled roughly between 20 and 50% all the time. Notice also that I have this tank encased in, ins in uh, insulated tiles. I have these built out of insulation. You don't have to, like, insulation's not really a thing. In most runs, I probably should have just built this out of ceramic for the sake of example, but... Yeah, that's what we got. And this is in its own little area because this is going to be containing hot oil, and I want to insulate that as much as possible. One thing to think about too, I do typically build my oil refineries out of something that will resist heat pretty well also. You can build it out of steel, you can also usually build out of gold and be okay. Same thing goes with these petroleum generators. You can build these out of gold, you can build them out of uh, steel. These are going to produce a lot of heat as well, so there's just a couple of things that I neglected to mention there. So. Okay, so now we have an automation cable running from here down to our shutoff. There we go. Now whenever this thing needs more oil, it's going to allow oil to pass through this. I do need to power this. Let's go ahead and do that. Also, we don't need this duplicate anymore, so sorry, Bert. Okay, so now that we have a need for oil, the oil is going to start flowing from this all the way up into that pipe at the top. I'm going to speed this up a little bit. It's going to flow all the way up. Notice that I'm using insulated uh, pipe here as well, just to prevent as much heat transfer, but also note that I'm doing this on purpose so that we don't have it just lingering inside uh, these pipes all the time. Eventually it'll fill up and we'll get back to it showing that it does shut off at a certain point. Okay, so now we have a liquid reservoir running into our oil refinery. You can see the piping here. So it goes into this and out of the uh, reservoir into the refinery. This does require a dupe to actually refine, so let's go ahead and spawn one of those. There we go. We do need a little bit of power, by the way, like I talked about in other ones. Uh, we do need to jumpstart this a little bit so we have the power to actually refine this. So let's go ahead and drop that really quickly and then delete it. So I'm going to do this and this. There we go. It's just going to charge up our batteries so that we can actually get some work done. So Otto's going to be refining some oil, and now we need to, or yeah, refining some oil and turning into petroleum. So we have petroleum coming out of here. Notice that it's going to be the same temperature as the oil that's going in. So this is still pretty hot, and I want a place to store it so that my petroleum generators have a little bit of a, a buffer so they don't run out of petroleum in the meantime. So I'm just going to copy this, drop another one here. By the way, you'll need to consider what you're making these liquid reservoirs out of as well, because these things can overheat if you're sending oil and hot petroleum and stuff like that into them. Especially if you're boiling it. Uh, you're going to need something pretty crazy or you're going to need a cooling setup to cool it down so you can actually store it in something that's reasonable. You don't need one of these super late game things to actually store it. So Otto's refining this. It's being sent down here and now we have these petroleum generators being fed because it's going into this uh, reservoir and out into our petroleum generators as I have the wiring or the piping hooked up there already. And I have this set to 80-20. I usually will set these to be a little bit lower, like 60 and 0. These are usually like my desperation power sources. So I've got that. And now they're running. And note that this does put off a couple of different things. It puts off polluted water and a pretty significant amount of it. This is not a trivial amount. So these things are going to generate quite a bit of water from this oil. And also some carbon dioxide. This can be annoying too because you need a lot of pumps to be able to keep all of the gases out of your base. Or you can sometimes uh, set it up so that these uh, are set up to just vent the carbon dioxide out into space. There's a couple of different setups you can do for that, um, but if you have them in like a centralized location, then you can do something like this and just pump it straight out. You can also use carbon skimmers, but you're going to get some other stuff in here that I'll mention in just a second. What happens with these oil refineries is these will also produce a couple of things. It'll produce petroleum, of course, at a basically 50% rate uh, of the crude oil that was coming in. It'll also produce off some natural gas, and the natural gas will be something that just gets put out into the air. So if we pause here, you can see little pockets of natural gas settling 
every once in a while. So that's going to be another side effect, and that'll kind of play, in, play into your natural gas generators as well. Also, one thing you can do if you want to, you can make sure that there's not too much petroleum sitting in this tank if you want to. So we could set up something like this, set up some numbers here as well, so that we're only allowed to refine if we're within a certain range as well. We're getting close to actually filling up this tank. Otto's going to be busy on this for a little while. We do have some uh, power demands that are not quite being met, only because we are not on a super stable grid right now, and this is on emergency power. So we can also bump this up just for the time being, just so we don't actually run out of power. But no, this is sustaining us as far as the oil refinery is concerned and as far as the gas pump is concerned. Uh, so we're looking pretty good. This is basically the, uh, the implementation of a super uh, simple oil setup. This is basically what you're going to need. Let's talk about a couple other things that may interact with this. Another thing is that if you need crude oil, you may not also be able to always rely on this. This may eventually run out. Some maps actually don't spawn with crude oil like this. You may need to get it yourself. So let's take a look at that. So sometimes you're going to encounter these oil reservoirs, and I've already built the setup here to enter to mine this out, stuff like that too. But these oil reservoirs are going to be something that you use to get crude oil out from regularly, but it's going to require a little bit of a different setup. So let's walk through that really fast. So what we need is a utility, we need an oil well. We're going to drop this on here. This has a ridiculously high overheat temperature, so what you make it out of kind of doesn't really matter. You just want to make sure it's not going to melt, so I'd say just don't build it out of lead. So copper in this case is fine. What happens with these oil wells is they require water and this is clean water. So we have a, a little bit of water here. Let's say you're getting it from a, a geyser or something like that. So I'm gonna go ahead and start pumping that in there. There's gonna be water coming in. And once it gets there, this oil well is gonna start and start just pushing out a little bit of oil at a time. It's a, about a third of a kilo, or sorry, 3.3 kilograms per second. So it's a decent amount. Uh, these things are pretty strong. So yeah, pretty good way to use your water, especially because on most runs you're going to have an excess of water sources. You can also feed this very hot water and it won't care. So if you have something that's putting out a lot of really hot water, then that will be a thing also. So a couple of things to get uh, up what we need to. What I will typically do in these types of setups is I will obviously set up a pump to get the oil out. But I'll also put this on some automation to make sure that there's a little bit of residual oil down here all the time. And the reason that I do that is because what happens with this, I want this to be above whatever. Uh, what happens with this is that this thing starts to get some back pressure. You can see this, this gauge here and there's a percentage on here. This is basically something that your dupe needs to come maintain every once in a while. And it's gonna release very hot natural gas. You can see it being stored in here at 572 Fahrenheit or 300 Celsius. Uh oh, what's happening? Oh, auto, Psh. Uh, Here, ghost, auto, I need you to go somewhere else so that I can delete you. Go here. Thank you. Goodbye. So, uh, like I was saying before, since uh, Otto was peeing on the ground, uh, I want to make sure there's a little bit here of oil so that I can cool down this natural gas that comes out. So this natural gas is sitting at an extremely hot temperature, and I don't want this to be pumped into any of my other systems because it might start overheating stuff. So what I would like instead is a pump in here that's probably more likely made out of steel. Let's go ahead and set that up so we can start pumping out the natural gas. And as long as it sits in this room for a little while, the oil will cool it down. There have been instances in the past where I have set up some uh, temp shift plates like this. You can just do them in like smaller lines like this if you really want to, where this will help just kind of uh, transfer heat. You don't have to do it this way, but you can if you want to. I only don't super encourage temp shift plates because they are so insanely expensive. Uh, but yeah, that's what you can do with this. So we've got our pump here that's going to pump out natural gas, but I don't want it running all the time. I want it only running when there's a certain amount and when the natural gas has been cooled just a little bit. So I'm going to set up a little bit more automation here. Let's set up an atmos sensor to make sure we have enough natural gas to warrant this thing being on in the first place. And let's set up a thermo sensor to make sure we're cooling it a little bit. It's going to be hooked to an AND gate, meaning that both of them need to be satisfied before we're going to turn on our pump. And let's set up what we want it to be. We want it to be above, let's say, 1500 grams. It's not like a really scientific number here, that's just a good amount to help it spread uh, and like share the heat and stuff. And I want to make sure this is below, let's say, 300 Fahrenheit, because that's what it comes out of the geyser anyway. So we'll just set up something like that. And then eventually this will get full enough with back pressure. I'm going to request that a dupe uh, release this like immediately. 
just so we can see what it's like. You'd normally put this around maybe like 50 or 60 or something like that. So let's go ahead and spawn a dupe and have them uh, undo this real fast. So they're gonna jump in here. They've got a liquid lock that they can use. They're gonna jump down there. And when the back pressure is high enough, they're basically just gonna release that. It's gonna release all the natural gas. Usually this will cool pretty easily. You don't necessarily need these temp shift plates, but they can help a little bit. Uh, but yeah, so this is the basic setup. Once we get enough oil in here, it will get piped back up here, just like we talked about. And uh, if you want to... I don't know what these other pipes are for. What am I smoking? All right, whatever. So if you want to set it up the same way we did before to make sure that the oil is not leaving the area, you can uh, set it up with one of these uh, shutoffs once again. So we're just, let's just go ahead and do that real fast. I really don't know what this extra pipe was for. It may have just been left over when I was building it. I forgot that it was there. <laughs> All right, so let's run this automation wire down really fast just to close this loop. Whatever, we're building through tiles that we shouldn't be allowed to, but we're going to call that fine. And there we go. So whenever this needs more... And whenever this is filled up enough, it will start pumping oil back up there and into our system. So, nothing too crazy there, but that's how you harvest oil from an oil well, if you wanted to look at that build. Like I talked about before, there's another way to do this. So let's talk about the, uh, let's talk about the other way to do this. This is going to be actually boiling the oil in a petroleum. Actually, I think I meant to do this in uh, a different section of the video. So let's skip that for now. We'll get to it later. Okay, next power type. Let's talk about steam. Uh, let's talk about these steam turbines more specifically. There's a bunch of different ways you can get power off of these steam turbines. Uh, and the easiest way is going to be one of these steam vents, which I have kind of blocked behind this igneous rock. So let's talk about how to uh, set up one of these up. First thing you'll need to do is obviously enclose this in some insulated tile, because the steam that's going to come out of here is at 932 Fahrenheit, 500 Celsius. It's extremely hot, so you don't want to mess around with that. So I'm going to pause since this is about ready to erupt. Um, what you're going to want to do first is you'll want to set something up so that uh, we can start vacuuming out the oxygen that's in here. You want only steam to be inside this chamber. You don't want anything else. Otherwise, your uh, steam turbines may get blocked up and stuff. So what I'm going to first do is I'm going to vacuum this out. I'm going to use like a steel or something like that. You don't necessarily have to because you don't want steam to be touching this. So likely whatever you build in here is going to break anyway. So with that said, whatever, let's just make it out of copper. Sure. I'm going to put this on a signal switch. And I'm going to uh, turn this on for right now. This is so I can turn it off once the steam starts actually erupting. And then we just need a little bit of power to go into here so that it'll all be ready to go. Looks like we do have a generator already, so we should be good. Thanks, past self. So, we're going to start vacuuming this out. I'm going to put this on a high-pressure gas vent just to make sure it can be pumped to wherever we're going to go. I'm going to pretend like this other area outside is the rest of our base, so that's where I just wind up pumping this to. So let's pretend that we've got all this done. No reason to wait for this long. Let me vacuum this out. Okay, so now what we have is we need to turn this off, by the way. Now we have is a vacuumed out room near a steam vent. And you would probably uncover this before you started vacuuming this out, so let's go ahead and do that. But you want to make sure to uncover it at a time where it's not erupting. Because if it's erupting and you have dupes in that area, that's going to be really, really bad. So... Now we have an uncovered steam vent in a vacuum. Now we just need the steam turbines to actually harvest it. So let's set that up. So we've got steam turbines here. We also need some cooling behind here, and we need some other stuff to keep these things cool. Because what's going to happen is these things are going to turn on once they're steam. They're going to be generating power, and the amount of power that they generate base is based upon the heat or the temperature of the steam that's in here. So we've got that set up. Uh, the steam turbines have a couple of requirements, so we can build them out of refined metal and plastics. They do require plastic. But once they suck up the steam, they're going to be producing very hot water that comes out of here. So the hot water needs to go somewhere. I'll usually send it into my water network, or if I really don't need it out into space or something like that. But yes, it'll be coming down this pipe. Here's the problem with these things. These things are going to generate a lot of heat, and they will overheat kind of quickly. Um, so you need some way to cool these things down. So let's back up just a little bit and talk about cooling, because cooling is going to be something you definitely need for a lot of your setups here. This is going to be the first one that might demand it, but your oil setups may also demand it as well, because that's going to generate a lot of heat also. So we, I have a whole video about, about cooling, but in the short of it is that you need some way to generate polluted water that's very cold, or some type of liquid that's very cold. And what I will do is I will use pipe to kind of snake it up into the areas that I need it to cool. 
so that there is just uh, cool water sitting in like these radiant pipes uh, and a liquid shot off nearby as well. So the liquid shot off is just going to be so that we have the cold water sitting in these pipes and absorbing a lot of the heat and then it'll flush it back out and dump it out whenever it's done. And I, I say when it's done, when it's warm enough. So I just have some thermo sensors here. You can put it on the pipe. You can put it in the actual air. So basically, once the area gets too hot, we're going to flush it and dump all the hot polluted water back into this pipe or back into this tank and get more cool water. So let's go ahead and hook that up in both of our places. Got one there. There we go. There's going to be some heat generated from these guys as well. You can see the temperature is already pretty high in here. But it's going to be more, more important for this area because these things are going to generate a ridiculous amount of heat. So we already have some uh, pipe or some uh, water in the pipes in the background here. You can see this is going to be cooling a bunch of our setups here for the for the future. So just note that whenever I talk about cooling, it's going to be the same setup, just radiant pipes filled with cold polluted water uh, sitting in some kind of uh, gas that's going to be nearby. So what we have is a area here that's going to be vacuumed out. You don't necessarily have to do this, but if you have access to hydrogen. I would definitely recommend adding hydrogen in these rooms because that's going to facilitate the best transfer of polluted water from the pipes to the actual turbines. So let's go ahead and fill this with hydrogen. And I usually like to pressurize this quite a bit, so I'm just going to put it at 10 kilograms per tile. So now we have cooling on these things. If the air temperature gets too high, I will cycle the water back out so you can see it did reach that threshold. I have it sitting at about 80. So if it ever gets higher than 80, I will flush it back out and we'll ask for new water. When we get new water, uh, it should cool this thing back down because the water that's coming in is sitting at, you know, 39 Fahrenheit, about 4 Celsius, pretty cold. And then eventually it will be like, okay, that's enough, and we can go ahead and start cooling it. So that's, that's pretty much it. A um, couple of things you can do with a steam setup is you can immediately set up uh, power transformers nearby because the power that you're going to want coming out of here is obviously going to be on this heavy watt wire so that you can hook it into the rest of your network. So you can set up uh, some power transformers here if you want to, especially to power other stuff or other equipment that might nearby, be nearby or something that might be in here. You want all this to be made out of insulated tiles and especially for this area, this is going to have, you know, 932 degree Fahrenheit steam. You don't want that overheating stuff that's on the outside of this room. So you want to build this out of insulated tile and more specifically, not run heavy watt wire in here. So if you need to power this with something, you definitely want to run it with the wires that can go through walls. So that's what a regular steam turbine setup looks like. Most of the time with these uh, vents, you can get away with just a couple of steam turbines. And notice that they will only be on sometimes. If you really want to, I would not recommend this, especially for the steam vents. You can put this on smart batteries so that you only use the vents or you only use the turbines when you actually need power, but for the most part, you don't want to do that because these are just going to overpressurize. So these ones I will actually not put on uh, smart batteries. Let me show you a couple of other steam turbine setups. Let's talk about volcanoes really quickly. This is the same type of idea, except for we're just going to boil water with this. So uh, volcanoes are going to just put out magma. You can see it here. Puts out a decent amount at a time. So what I will typically do is we're going to do the same thing where we have a room full of oxygen, we encase it in tiles, we dig this out at a point where it's not erupting, which we should probably make sure that we do that. You can tell when it's at least dormant, and that's, that would be the time that I would do it. And then we can set up uh, some pumps here. These pumps uh, you will not need to use once the room is vacuumed out. It's only for vacuuming out the room, so let's go ahead and do that. We can make it out of copper if we really want to. I'm going to put this on a switch as well because we don't want to actually vacuum out the steam that's going to be in here. Whoops, we want this to be on for right now. So I'm going to start vacuuming out the oxygen. Once we get this all vacuumed out, then we should be ready to start filling it with something else. And that something else is going to be water. Uh, we're going to put just a little bit of water in here so that when the magma comes out, it boils the water and it turns it into steam so that our handy dandy steam turbines up here can turn on when it's time for them to turn on. So I'm going to put like three of them in here. You can put more, you can put less. One thing you want to be careful of is to not put too few, otherwise they will get overrun and you'll have a hard time dealing with the heat that's in there. So it's definitely what you can do. So once this erupts, uh, it's going to produce a lot of really hot magma. You can see the temperature here is ridiculous. Um, this is also going to mean that whatever insulated tiles you put around this, you want to make sure it can resist that heat. 
So this magma is basically liquid uh, igneous rocks. You need something that's going to have a higher melting point than igneous rock. So typically what I'll do if I need to see these temperatures, you can just do something like this. Build them out so you can see the actual temperatures that they melt at. Uh, in, I'm going to go ahead and, and cheat a little bit and say that obsidian is going to be one of the best things that you can use because its melting point is going to be higher than what the magma is going to put out. Which you can see... Oh, what is this doing? Why is this not telling me the temperature that's coming out at? Uh, I don't know what's happening. Oh, I'm in the properties. Okay. <laughs> it's going to come out at 3000 Fahrenheit, whereas this can resist up to 4040. 4940. Uh, the rest of these, like sedimentary rock, granite, igneous rock, sandstone, they're not going to be enough. So you need to make sure to choose the right material for this that can actually resist the volcano uh, spewing out magma. So let's pretend that I've got this all vacuumed out. Vacuum. We need our cooling set up here, obviously, which we already have. We need power running up to this. So let's go ahead and run some power up. Oh, we have that. We just need to connect it to the rest of our heavy watt wires. We can connect this down to here now that we have power being generated. So, hooray. Um, and then we need hydrogen in this room like we talked about before, so let's go ahead and do that. Let's get some hydrogen. Fill this up. There, so now we've got heating, or we've got cooling covered. We need to be ready to receive the magma that's going to come out of here, though. So we need water, and we need water to sit at the bottom of this, and it'll just basically flash boil it. And the water will maintain uh, the cooling in here that we need. It'll be the reason that the steam turbines are able to w function, because we need to function on the steam. So let's start pumping a little bit of water in here. Do I have this hooked up to anything? No. So let's build a chamber really fast for it. There we go. Let's grab a pump. Let's pump it into here. We only want to fill this to a certain degree, by the way, so you need to be very careful about this, otherwise you can choke up the volcano and make it not work anymore run some wire in here as well. And finally, put some water. Water. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're just going to be pumping water into this uh, vacuumed out chamber. I'm going to turn the switch off so we don't pump out any steam by accident. You really want to watch the levels that you're putting in here, by the way. The reason that you want to watch your levels is because this volcano is only capable of erupting if the pressure around it, specifically the air pressure, is below 150 kilograms per tile. So you really want to watch this, and what I would typically do is I will count the number of tiles tall that this is, and multiply that by 100 for the amount of water that I need in these bottom tiles. Totally forgot I had a dupe here. Get out of here, Marie. Uh, so what we want to go for, if this is 3 tall, where was I? Here. If this is 3 tall, I want to go for 300 kilograms per tile. Let's just go ahead and pretend that we did that, and I'll just paint it in. Let's say 300. Paint this in, and that's about as much as we want. So, this should be good. I'm going to analyze this so we know when this is actually going to erupt. It's not going to erupt for another seven cycles, so let's just spawn some magma in here and pretend this is what we're going to do. Now, this is another thing that we need to be careful of. Um, if we're not careful, this can get things that are way too hot, way too fast. If you want to, and if you feel more comfortable, you can build some temp shift plates in here to kind of help absorb the temperature. You do need to make sure that you can actually absorb this with the materials that you're building out of. So this is another check that you're going to need to do to make sure what can actually go in here. We'll use obsidian since we already know it's not going to melt. And it's a semi-common thing on a lot of maps. So we'll just go ahead and drop a bunch of temp shift plates here. Then let's spawn some magma. Let's see how much this is going to spawn at once. This is going to spawn 285 kilograms for 65 seconds. So doing some really rough math. You're not supposed to do this on stream. That's about 15... Uh, tons of magma per eruption. So let's go ahead and spawn that. Magma. We said 15 tons, so it's 15,000 kilograms. And it can't quite go that high, so I'll spawn one blob, and then I will spawn another smaller one. There we go. So it's going to be about this much magma. It's not going to all happen at once, but this is going to demonstrate how fast this water is going to boil and how quickly these things are going to need to turn on. You're going to need to have these things ready, too. And I'm going to talk about one other thing here really quickly, just to be uh, sure that we can handle this. So it's going to drop down. It's going to fill this up really, really fast. It's going to flash boil all the water. This is going to overheat. That's totally fine. We don't need to worry about that. 
Once you get past this first stage, you're basically just going to be left with a bunch of igneous rock that's solidified and sitting on the bottom, and it's going to be consistently heating this steam. Uh, the steam we can already see is at 600 degrees Fahrenheit. A couple of things you may need to watch out for, and this is why I'm going to build a couple of extra things. One thing that can happen is the steam and things in a volcano can harden. So we want to make sure that's not going to harden, and if it does, that we dig it out. So I'm going to dig a ro I'm going to put a robo miner here that covers at least enough spaces to cover the entire volcano. And I'm going to hook this up to power, which we had our power lines melt. You can build this out of something better, but it won't come out that hard. But yeah, you did see our lines got melted here just a little bit. Usually won't come out all at once. That doesn't typically happen, but whatever. So I have a robo miner in here just to make sure that it's going to be uh, okay to resist, or rather dig out if we need to. The problem with this is that if you build it out of steel, it can still overheat. This is why receiving this first batch of uh, magma is really important, otherwise stuff in there can break. So if you need to build out a taller chamber, if you need to build out more temp shift plates to absorb the heat, or if you need to do anything like that, that's very critical to make sure that these things don't get destroyed. So I'm going to go ahead and deconstruct that for right now. But that is something you need to keep an eye on, and you can see that the steam turbines are working pretty hard now that the uh, volcano has erupted in order to cool this down. Note also that I have the water from the steam turbines heading straight back into this chamber, so I don't need to send in new water all the time. This will just remain steady, and as I receive more uh, eruptions, it will handle it better and better over time. Partially because there will be steam in here already, but also partially because we'll have igneous rock that will help absorb that as well. So the first eruption is usually the worst one. After that, it should settle down. I should also note that this is not the only use for these volcanoes. You can use them for other heating needs that you might have, such as boiling petroleum, which again, we'll talk about later. We're not necessarily going to talk about right now. All right, more steam power stuff. I know this is going to be insanely long, and I, I knew this was going to happen from the beginning, so we're just going to have to keep rolling with it. Let's talk about magma. So sometimes at the bottom of the map, like I talked about over here, there's going to be these pockets of magma somewhere. Or if you play on like a volcano map, there may be a ton of magma just sitting around the map. So let's talk about how to harvest energy from that. Um, this is going to be kind of an interesting one, and I'm going to just build this out as we go. But the idea is going to be that we have a room full of water here. I'm going to skip all this stuff, by the way, just because we've seen this before. You're going to have a room full of water, and you can put as much or as little water in here as you want to. This one's not as important, so let's go ahead and get some water. Let's brush it in here, something like this. Sure, you can put a ton in there, you can put a little, it doesn't really matter. Then we'll go ahead and vacuum out the rest of the uh, oxygen. So if we just have regular water there. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do something that we hook up this chamber with metal tiles at the bottom to this by some sort of conductive material. So what I'll typically like to do is I will set up a access point into the magma and have this kind of floating off of the ground a little bit just so we can control our ventures into here a little bit more. And I'll explain what that means. So let's go ahead and set up a liquid lock, because we're going to need dupes to come in here every once in a while to potentially expand further into the magma. So let's set up something like this. Say this is our base, sure. Uh, and then let's set up the same uh, access points that we had before. So let's get a station, atmosphere checkpoint that points toward where we want them to go with the atmosphere. Some docks. All right, we kind of get the point. Same type of setup here. I'm not going to hook it up all the way. Uh, let's go ahead and brush in our salt water just to complete the liquid lock. Now, this is a little bit scary. Uh, this is where all of the heat transfer is going to occur. You may need something better than salt water here. So I did talk about putting salt water here as absorbing the uh, heat transfer. Let's do something else. Uh, let me go ahead and destroy this. Let me put in petroleum instead. Uh, this is one of the better things for absorbing heat, and especially because if it's going to be uh, maintained by the other side of your base, or if you have some other cooling mechanism, you can do that. You can also put petroleum here and run some kind of cooling lines like this down in there if you want to keep this petroleum cooler. But you need to make sure this petroleum doesn't gas off and that you have access to this. And also, you could potentially put this behind a second liquid lock if you're really worried about it um, uh, getting too hot. So you could do something like this if you wanted to have two different entrance points or two different liquid locks like that and move your move your suits up here so that this is kind of a really intricate way to prevent heat transfer into your base and we try to keep as much heat into here as possible. So we're going to seal this other side so now we have a chamber that faces this area and this is going to be our magma 
And we need something that's going to convey heat. Uh, by the way, something I should have mentioned, a good way to prevent heat transfer as well, if you don't have anything happening here, and I guess I should have remembered this because this is why I set it up this way. Whoa, I didn't know that was going to happen. Uh, so you vacuum this out. If you vacuum this out, there is no heat transfer that can occur. And especially if you're sitting on abyss light tiles, you should be good. So I should have remembered that I set it up this way on purpose. And that's because this vacuum will prevent any of this uh, extra stuff being necessary. So my bad. Let me delete all this stuff. So if we have this area vacuumed out, which you can do with a, again, a simple gas pump, which I'm just going to skip since we've seen that a couple of times before. You're going to have a setup like this. And then what you're going to want to do is set up a bunch of mechanized airlocks, probably made out of steel just so they don't melt. Again, this is going to be extremely hot magma. And it's going to be touching things that are extremely hot, so you want something that's not going to melt. So what you can do is you can set up steel, something like this, that's going to transfer the heat from the magma, or from whatever surface you have down here, to the uh, metal tiles up here. And then you can set up automation, like so. Make sure this is not going to melt. It probably will, so let's go ahead and not do that. We need to build this out of steel as well. Let's build this out of steel. Let's run some steel cables to uh, set this all up on automation. Being sloppy about this, but whatever, trying to be fast. Then what happens is when you need to work in here and when you need to expand down here, you can open up these doors so that your dupes can come in here and work. When you need heat transfer, you can do this and you can close them again. You can also set up more intricate uh, setups here to make sure that you don't overheat this water and that you're not overheating this area. So we'll do that in just a bit. Then what you would typically do is set up something like this. Set up a line of steel, like so. Also make sure it's separated by abyssalite or something here so that you're not transferring the heat from the steel over to the rest of your base. Looks like we need more petroleum. There we go. Um, and then what you can do is you can also create something like this. Like you can create a little bit of an access point for your dupes to work in. So let's build a ladder. Let's build out something we know is not going to melt. And then you can just start building steel tiles down like that and digging this out. So you get a little bit of heat transfer into these tiles. You can see these tiles heating up really, really quickly. And you can also increase your surface area on this as you build ladders down in there. Now this is going to be too hot for your dupes to usually work in. So if you need to expand, you're typically just going to expand by building steel tiles down one at a time. And then hopefully this will harden. You're usually only going to be expanding when this is actually hardening into igneous rock. Uh, but this can be a way that you can consistently maintain how much heat transfer you're getting from this thing. By creating this chamber that's vacuumed out, uh, it should be vacuumed out, which we just messed up because we didn't have our liquid lock here. Let's go ahead and do that again. There we go. This will be all vacuumed out. Your dupes can eventually expand further and further into the magma, depending on how deep this goes, because sometimes these are really big and you want to get better heat transfer. So what I'm going to do is, let's say we've got this all set up. We have dupes able to continue come in, continually come in here and maintain this. I'm going to close these. What's going to happen is this is going to transfer heat from these tiles to these doors, to these doors, then to these tiles. It will eventually boil this water and we'll try to accelerate the best we can. Let's go ahead and build a second layer just so the heat transfer happens a lot faster. There we go. A lot faster heat transfer happening. It's heating up this water decently. It still will take a little while. Let's set up our steam turbines in the meantime. So we've got these guys sitting here. A couple of other things you can set up on a setup like this is you can make sure these steam turbines are only turning on at certain temperatures just so you get the maximum amount of power out of what they offer. So I'm going to go ahead and build a temperature sensor. Let's put it on automation wire. And let's say that these can only operate if the steam in here is above 400 degrees Fahrenheit. You can dial this in a little bit more. Uh, the maximum is something where in like 380 or something like that. And then the other thing we want to do is we want to make sure this doesn't get too hot. So we need a second thermo sensor to make sure that we're closing or rather opening these doors whenever uh, this is set up this way. This is something I didn't mention in my automation video, but we can just run the wire directly in here so that if either we turn it on manually or this turns it on, then uh, it will open the doors. So I want to say if this is above, say like 600, I want these doors to open. We may need to fudge this a little bit to get this to happen a little bit faster. So let me go ahead and sample this water. Let's turn up the temperature here so that it boils a little bit faster. Brush. There we go. So we've got it turned into steam. We do need this to be a certain temperature before this actually will start uh, operating correctly. So the steam turbines will not actually turn on until uh, 
the steam reaches like 256 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh no, we got some pressure damage going on here. This can be one of the awkward points of setting this up. Let me just fix this really fast. If you put too much water in here, that can always happen. This vent can get blocked, so you will want to be a little bit careful about that. There we go. So once the steam gets hot enough, uh, the steam turbines will turn on and they will start to run. We want this to maintain between this temperature of 400 and 600 degrees Fahrenheit. So at 600 degrees, this will stop heating this room up. At 400 degrees, it will start cooling it down by virtue of running these steam turbines. This is also a place I can recommend. Oh, we need a hydrogen in here, by the way. Hydrogen. Let's overpressurize this once again, as it lags super hard because I'm targeting every tile on the map. So we've got this all set up. This is a functioning setup, and I want to also potentially ration this because this is a non-renewable source. Like, this is eventually going to cool to a point where you can't get power out of it anymore. It's going to be a long time, but it'll happen. So let's set up a smart battery so that we're only using stuff when we actually need it. Oh, it looks like I put the opening over here. Oh, no! No, I pressed the wrong button. I meant to do that. All right, whatever. So let's set up a smart battery here. Let's deconstruct this. Let's set up some ventilation. And let's set up the actual battery. So you can do this where if... You can set up some kind of system where you will only turn this on if it's meeting both of these criteria. So let's go ahead and destroy this. Meaning that we're only going to turn these on if the smart battery is saying we need to and if the room is hot enough. So we'll go ahead and we can also dial this down just a little bit just to keep it between four and 500 degrees if we really want to. Then let's set up like an AND gate, meaning that both of these things need to be true before we can actually turn this on. So let's do something like that. I know this is sloppy. We're not trying to be super clean about this. We're just trying to get it done. So there we go. And there we go. So this will only turn on now if we need power. So we can set this to whatever we want to. This is, again, a non-renewable source, but it is a very convenient source. So this hooked up to a smart battery and hooked up to these temperature sensors. We can see the steam has reached above 500 degrees, so we're going to open these doors, meaning that there's no heat transfer that's going to happen between these tiles and these tiles anymore. So this is a fully automated steam power setup right now. Light blocked. What happened? Oh, I deleted it. Well. So this is a fully automated steam power setup just from the power of magma. So just having this magma chilling down here is also a setup that we can continually expand into as this does harden. So let's just pretend we did something like that real quick. Let's say igneous rock, solid. Let's just paint it in here, something like this. Let's say this starts to harden to the point that you're not getting the, quite the heat transfer you want to anymore. At that point, you can start digging in, doing something like this, putting your ladders a little bit further down, and then expanding your steel down into areas like that so that you get more surface area to transfer heat into. So this is a fully automated, fully renewable, uh, in terms of like ex expandable way to actually harvest these things. Just needed the help of these doors uh, and help of a little bit of automation, but yeah, there you go. Steam power, lots of steam power for a really long time. This is incredibly strong. This can be something that can basically finish the game out for you. You might not, e not need to go any further. Oh man, this segment is really long. Okay, let's keep going. We're just going to power through this. This is going to be a ridiculously long video, but you know, that's what the chapters are for, and that's why we got all this stuff. And yeah, doing this all in one take is quite the uh, tax, but we're going to keep up at it. So let's talk about hydrogen power now. Hydrogen power is uh, going to be coming from these vents, and you can see it erupts at 932 Fahrenheit, so it's not something we could be super casual with. You can see it's erupting now, so let's go ahead and dig this out. Same drill as before, you want to vacuum this out with something, but you want to vacuum that out in a little bit of a different way. I'm going to set up a gas pump with steel here. And note that I have this all surrounded by metal tiles. I'm going to set a door here so that we're only allowing stuff to touch this gas pump if it's been cooled enough. Because this gas pump can only resist up to 527. This comes out at 932. So we need to cool the hydrogen just a little bit. So that's why we have these metal tiles around it. Let's pretend that we vacuumed everything out really fast. So let's go ahead and fill this with vacuum, which sounds really funny. And we need to set up some automation here to only allow this door to open if this room is cool enough. So I'm going to go ahead and grab a Atmo sensor. I'm going to grab a Thermo sensor. I'm going to grab an AND gate. I'm going to be powering through this just because there's whole tutorials about all this automation if you need to check this out. So feel free to do that. 
I'm going to set it up to that. So we want to only allow this to open if there is enough gas pressure. And if we are below, let's say, I don't know, 500 degrees. Maybe even a little bit lower. Let's say 450. The rest of this heat is going to be transferred into water, which I'm going to put in this chamber, which again, you would just vacuum this out. I'm going to skip that part. So let's say it's vacuumed out and let's put a little bit of water in here. Not too much like I did last time and totally messed up our, our setup. Let's go ahead and do that. There we go. Maybe even destroy a couple tiles of this. So it's not too much. Now we have that. And of course the heat is going to eventually boil this water. So that's what we need steam turbines for. So let's go ahead and drop some steam turbines up here. You can just get away with one. That's typically what you'll need. This is not going to produce a tremendous amount of heat. This is mostly just to get the cooling factor from the steam turbine and not necessarily the power factor. So let's not worry too much about that. Okay, so now we have this. This is going to erupt. Here we go. That was perfect timing, by the way. So we need to make sure this is above 1500. There we go. This door is going to close. So once we get enough hydrogen in here and once we're sure that it's cooled enough, we're going to allow it to flow into this gas pump. As far as... So we have a method of harvesting the hydrogen, just like we did with the natural gas, where this is just a setup to harvest it and make us able to harvest it. So you need to cool it first with this. You're eventually going to pump it out with that. Now we need a place to store it. So I usually will just make a room like this. You can also use uh, the gas reservoirs like we used in the natural gas setup. You can set up something like that. We're just going to go ahead and pretend we vacuumed this out because we don't want to watch a big room get vacuumed out forever. And I will typically dump this into a room that's something like this. Both because this is kind of the lazy option, but also because metal can sometimes sometimes be hard to come by. So we've got a room to store our hydrogen, which is going to be here. Finally, we're going to need a mechanism to actually put it into our uh, power generators. So let's go ahead and drop some of those. We've got these hydrogen generators, which we're going to go ahead and put in here like this. There we go. And we'll drop a couple of smart batteries. By this point, you might need the extra storage anyway. Only one of them is going to actually be hooked up by automation. So you can ration your uh, hydrogen that you're harvesting. I'm hoping, by the way, I'm speeding through this just a little bit, both because this video is really long and both because if you've watched a lot of the video, or if you've seen some other setups, some of this stuff is stuff I've already covered. So um, I'm not going to explain over and over what a smart battery does just uh, for your awareness. So yeah. Then we need to drop pipes to actually get the hydrogen to the generators. So that's what I'm doing now. Let's drop this. There you go. So now we've got a fully functional hydrogen setup. We can say what we want it to actually operate on. Let's say something pretty aggressive, like 9030, because this is one of the most powerful power sources in the entire game. And I want to use this before I would use coal, and maybe I can start weaning off that so there's less maintenance on that. But this is pretty much the setup. Um, I do have a setup of, for cooling here. We will need to cool the turbine as well as these. I'm going to go ahead and flood this with hydrogen, which I would normally do anyway. So let's go ahead and do that. Just to allow the best heat transfer between the background pipes and the things that are making things hot in here. And there we go. So we've got a pretty much fully set up uh, hydrogen setup. And we need to definitely run some power cabling here, by the way which we can do via some transformers. I'm just going to fudge it really fast just because this is running so long. Let's go ahead and fudge it. We definitely want to run the smaller cables into here. You don't want to run these uh, heavy watt joint plates because these let a lot of heat transfer happen. We want to keep the heat as contained as possible. So again, the usual drill is very insulated tiles around these things. Uh, yeah. Let's go ahead and run power to the other places that we need it, such as the place to dump out our heating areas. So now that we've got this, this gas pump is going to be running hydrogen up through these pipes and it will be generating power for us. So once we get enough hydrogen that's coming in here and once our smart battery actually wants us to produce power, which it should be, yep, uh, these will start producing power. We're not getting a lot of hydrogen quite yet, so you can also set this up on something that will not waste too much power because we are definitely wasting power right now. Let's go ahead and do something like this. Make sure this is not going to turn on unless we are above a certain threshold, let's say 50 grams. Uh, maybe even more than that. Let's say a thousand so we can allow a little bit of storage build up Okay, cool. So we've got this functioning So what happens is the hydrogen comes out at a very high temperature It's being emitted at 932 once we get enough pressure and once it gets cooled by this water that's up here in these tiles It'll open this door the gas pump will pump it into this room This room is basically just a big holding chamber for hydrogen You can make this as big or as small as you need to and then uh, when we have enough in this area, which I'll just go ahead and fudge really fast, 
it'll start pumping it out into our generators. The generators will be producing power from hydrogen, as you can see there. These generators are really strong. Once you get one of these hydrogen vents, if you can run five generators on this pretty regularly, which most of the time you can, this can almost power your entire base. So hydrogen power is ridiculous. If you find one of these vents, this is definitely one of the best vents in the entire game. I would say along with the uh, cool slush geyser for cooling. Those two together are probably the two best vents and uh, geysers, so if you see those, definitely go get them. All right, speed running through this part. Let's speed run through solar, which is the last major power source. So let's talk about this. Uh, this is going to be up in space because you need some access to light. There is a light overlay that you can access here to see how lit something is. There's a bunch of problems with space, and I'm just going to breeze over this because I will eventually make a video about um, at the whole space setup. So I'm just going to kind of speed run through this. But the general idea that you need here is you need bunker doors to absorb impacts from asteroids that come down. Once you have those, you need some mechanism to open and shut these doors, which I'm just going to speed run through like I talked about. So let's just put this on automation for right now. And you will want to power these, by the way, so that they open and close faster than by default. So I'm just going to drop a dev generator. Again, just speed running through this, but the general idea is that you want this type of setup. You want the bunker doors to absorb meteor impacts. You want a secondary layer for this regolith to all settle to. And then you need some way to dig those out so that the solar panels actually have access to something. To, to light, that is. So light can travel through these mesh tiles. They can travel through these... Uh, Tiles over here, these window tiles, you can use either one. Excuse me. What you can do if you are a super beginner and you want to use solar power is you can just set jobs to come up here every once in a while. You can see the solar panels are not operating at full capacity, and that's because a lot of their light is getting blocked. Whoops. A lot of their light is getting blocked by this regolith that's in the way. So you can run jobs up here if you want to have dupes that live nearby. Just come up here and clear this out every once in a while. And as long as they have a clear view, they're going to be generating a good amount of power. So that's the super basics of these solar panels. I know I'm speed running this a lot. There's a lot of videos that do talk about the space setup and I will have a separate one explicitly for this. So just look out for that if you want to know more of the nuance. Let's talk about a couple of other details with these though. These solar panels can be stacked in certain ways to get a better uh, usage of the light that comes through. So the light basically comes through vertically. They just come down in straight lines. It's a very basic doesn't really make a lot of real world, world sense, but that's how it works. So they just come down in these straight lines, and you can see they illuminate all the way down forever until they get blocked by something. So you can get better efficiency out of these solar panels by building them in kind of a stacked manner. There's a whole bunch of research on this that I'm not going to get into the most efficient way to do this, but it looks something similar to this, where you have them stacked so that some of them are only exposed to part of their panels, but they still get a good efficiency off of them, like a good 80%-ish efficiency so that you're getting basically not quite double, but pretty close to the amount of production from these solar panels from the same amount of space. So like we talked about before, I'm just gonna set this up really fast on some automation so that we can see these things in action. We can see the actual values that we have there. Let's hook these doors up to power. There we go. Hook them up to automation. There we go. So these will open up. And once they get exposure to light, they will start running. And once we get to about midday, we'll be able to see the efficiency that these things are getting. But it's you'd have to look up the actual threads and stuff. There's a lot of people that did really advanced research into how this works. Let me clear the regolith. There's lots of people that did advanced research into how this actually works. You can see what's more and less efficient by you know percentage points, but uh, that's pretty much... Uh, Something I'm not going to cover in too much detail because you can find that detail if you're really interested. But the basic idea is that you're getting more efficiency for your space here by stacking them this way. We're now at the point of the day where we're getting full power from our solar panels. Oh, I need to close these because this is demonstrating exactly why you need these because meteor strikes will come down. You want to hook this automation up to uh, something like this, like a space scanner that can scan for uh, meteors and it has its own automation setup. So I'm just doing this for the speedrun sake. You would normally not have this on manual controls for what it's worth. But there we go. <laughs> but yeah, the setup here is that you're going to get a decent amount of efficiency. So you can see at peak hours we're at 380 here. The ones that are stacked are not quite at 380. They're a little bit lower. But because they're stacked like this, we're actually getting more efficiency for our space. So just wanted to touch on that really quickly. 
Let's talk about a couple of other clearing methods that I'm going to talk about really fast, just so that you can think about how to do this on your own if you don't want to watch another tutorial. As far as clearing the regolith automatically, you can use these robo miners. And they're set up like this in a very specific pattern so that they can mine up here and they can mine everywhere around and still give full view of these uh, solar panels. So there's a couple of barriers to these. One is that you have to run power all the way along here, which can be a little bit of a tax. Another thing is that these generate heat, so you need to find a way to cool these. So this can get a little bit weird. What I see a lot of people doing and what I've done in the past is you get a little bit of petroleum, you drop it in these areas, it may drip off and it may evaporate, that's fine. As long as you have a little bit of petroleum sitting down there, oh, you need to have something behind it as well, my bad. As long as you have a little bit of petroleum sitting there, you can also use a temp shift plate if you really want to, but as long as you have a little bit of petroleum sitting there, uh, that will facilitate cooling. So we have a little bit of petroleum sitting there, like 300 grams. Then you would run some pipes that would be something like this. You could use liquid pipes, you could use radium pipes, you can do whatever you want, just to facilitate the heat transfer. You'd do something like this, where you'd send cold water through these pipes to keep these guys cool. And then when it's time for these uh, things to open, let me add some power here. When it's time for these doors to open, which we're just going to fudge because there's a meteor strike going on right now. Um, well, let's just fudge this part. Let's sample this regolith and just brush it down here. When it's time, when these things have actually uh, gone off, it's not going to fall right here because it'll get stuck on the top. When these doors have opened, then uh, regolith will drop down and these robo miners are going to start getting to work. So once that happens, they'll start digging these out. And this is one way to clear it if you don't want to clear it manually. So you can set up something like this, have some kind of cooling set up here to keep these guys cool. Um, I'm not going to build up the whole cooling setup because we've seen a bunch of that before already. But that's the general idea of how this type of setup would work. Another setup you can use is you can just use uh, some mechanized airlocks. These can be made out of pretty much anything. And you could just set up something like this. So that way when the regolith falls down, on these doors. You can set up a sophisticated automation setup. I talk about this in my automation video, but you can set up something fancy where you set up a timer sensor and you can set up a signal switch if you want to have it open manually. But the timer sensor uh, is going to be hooked up to something like this and and a not gate. And what's going to happen is when you want the system to crush the regolith, which you can do manually, you can set up a complicated uh, setup here, uh, then this will open and shut the doors at like so. And when the doors close again, it will delete the regolith. So you can see that all the regolith is gone. There's not even piles on the ground. Then when you want the system to turn off, you can just flip a switch like that, and its resting state will be open so that you now have access to your solar panels seeing out into space. There's a bunch of different methods you can do. I'm not going to get too intricate with those. Wow, this segment was over an hour. Uh, there's still a little bit more to talk about with power. So, like I said, this video is going to be insanely long. Okay, my friends. Let's finish this absolute monster of a video with the last two sections. The first of them being the miscellaneous section, which I talk about concepts and builds and stuff like that that are in the game, but they're not... Necess they're both not necessary to win games and they're also not common in like a more practical run. If your only objective is to finish the game, none of these are necessary whatsoever. Um, they could be necessary if you wanted to run a very silly base or if you wanted to just really see how powerful you could possibly get. They're definitely fun to play around with. Um, and if you have certain bases that demand stuff like this or if you're intentionally depriving yourself of something, these are useful things to know, so let's talk about them. In each of these, I'm going to talk about why people do it and why you would not want to do it. So, first of all, we're going to be talking about how to convert your crude oil into petroleum at a better ratio than uh, this oil refinery. So this oil refinery, if you were to put in 100 kilograms of uh, crude oil, you'd only get 50 kilograms of petroleum out of it. So it refines at basically a 50% efficiency. However, if you click on this, na on this natural oil, lol, on this crude oil, you can see that it vaporizes and turns into petroleum at 251 degrees, or 200, jeez, I'm just all over the place, 751 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, this is interesting because if we heat this up enough, that means that we get a conversion of petroleum without spending any time from our dupes or without spending any energy on the oil refinery. 
plus the added bonus of you get a one-to-one -one exchange rate. So it's 100% efficiency on converting crude oil into petroleum if you just do it by the heating method. Now the reason that people don't do this, the reason that people chiefly don't do this is because magma is not super easy to work with, it's not super accessible on a lot of maps, and also the exchange rate is not usually something that you are absolutely in need of in most bases. Um, there have legitimately been some bases in which I have only used the natural crude oil that settled on the map to do everything I needed to do. And that came with power, with rocket fuel, with anything else I needed for petroleum. And it just didn't demand a setup like this, so most of the time I just don't do it. Um, so that's, that's the reason why people do it, and that's the reason why people don't do it. Let's look at a very uh, rough example. This is not a super refined example, so I'm not going to claim this is like the best build of all time. This is just to demonstrate some general concepts and how you could potentially employ this in your own game if you wanted to mess around with it. So, let's grab some crude oil. Let me go ahead and turn on my fancy sandbox tools here. Let's sample this. Let's put in a decent amount. I don't know, 700 kilograms maybe. Let's go ahead and brush this in. By the way, I have this in here with a leaky oil fissure, and one of the reasons I do is because this is one of the better ways to turn it into petroleum. Only because the oil is already produced at 620 when we know that the oil is going to boil at 751 or 400 degrees Celsius for those of you that are more in tune with that. Also I have a bunch of doors here that are on automation that are just on switches. You'd probably want a more automated setup if you were going to do something like this. So I'm just going to skip over that part. I'm just going to use manual switches for everything. So what I have is just collecting in a room here. You can use any oil. It doesn't necessarily have to be from this uh, oil fissure. So let's just go ahead and open this down into the next chamber. This next chamber is going to be like a heating chamber where we can convert the petroleum, or sorry, the crude oil into petroleum. So I'm just going to let it dribble in there a little bit. Sure, that's enough. Let's go ahead and close it. So we're just going to go ahead and convert this. And the way I'm going to do this is, you might have seen this before, basically have some kind of chamber full of magma, or maybe this is bordering like a magma biome or something like that, which I talked about in some builds before. Or maybe you even have a volcano, which you can do, uh, surrounded with metal tiles that are connected to these mechanized airlocks and then again surrounded by all these insulated tiles. These airlocks, when they're open, will not exchange any heat, so the temperature of this tile is going to match the temperature of the oil, whereas the temperature of this tile is going to match the temperature of the magma. If you close the doors and you put them together, the heat exchange happens, and there we go. You start to get stuff heating up, and the crude oil will take a little while to heat up, but once it reaches that point where it will turn into petroleum, you will exchange all this crude oil for petroleum at a one-to-one -one rate. One thing you do need to watch out for, and we're going to talk about this in the next section, and that is that if you uh, have this crude oil and you heat it up at petroleum and it heats up too far, there's like a breaking point where it turns into something else. So it can go into petroleum. If it gets to 1,000 degrees, it's going to turn into sour gas. From there, you can't condense it back down to petroleum or anything like that. That has its own properties. We will talk about that immediately after this section, though, because it is very interesting. So we're still heating this up. Uh, rather than waiting for too, too long, let's go ahead and sample this and let's just turn it into petroleum. And we know that the rate, or sorry, the temperature that is going to happen at is about 750. Let's just fudge that a little bit and let's say 800. So I'm gonna sample this, 800, brush it into petroleum. We'll just go ahead and replace it for the sake of, uh, whoops, 580, that's about what we had. We'll just go ahead and brush it in here for the sake of speed. And then once it's petroleum, I'm going to open these doors again so that this does not heat up too much. So there we go. We have petroleum in here. Oh, this petroleum is not nearly hot enough. 800, let's say. Brush. There we go. Okay, so let's just skip all the part where it boils. It does take a little while, but it eventually will happen. Now I'm just going to drop it down into another chamber, which is going to cool it. And the reason I'm going to cool it is for a couple reasons. One is because you can get extra energy off of it. Uh, just for having it heated up in the first place, so might as well kind of double dip on the energy uh, potential on this petroleum. But secondly, in a lot of these builds, um, they require elements that are from space missions, and most of the time, if, if you want to run this, you don't want to necessarily do it once you're at space missions, because you're so close to ending the game anyway, assuming that your objective is just to win the game, that going further... Getting those other elements, uh, you definitely can, but if you don't want to get that far and you want to build this before you get that far, you will need to cool this petroleum before you introduce it to a pump. Reason being is because these pumps, the best material you have for it, like in the mid-game-ish area, is steel. These can only resist up to about 527, 
Whereas our petroleum could be coming down at like 800 degrees. So that's definitely what it's at right now. So this area right here is just a little bit of a cooling chamber set up with some steam turbines, some area that we're going to generate steam from. This all should look fairly familiar from earlier sections. So let's go ahead and open this door. So we're just going to go ahead and drop it into this chamber. Eventually it will all drain to the point that there's like nothing in between here. We could close the door at that point. We could do whatever. Again, I'm just kind of hand waving considering I don't want to build out complicated automation for this section if it's just a miscellaneous section anyway. So there we go. We're boiling the steam or we're boiling the water. The steam is eventually going to heat up to a point that these steam turbines can cool them down. So this is kind of just a little bit of a cooling area and this is going to take a long time to happen too. You can see the petroleum is taking a little while to actually cool down and it's still being heated up by this petroleum that's still pouring in. So we could close these doors. Uh, we could do a couple of things to prevent this from happening. You could also have a door that's more on, on the side here rather than vertically. That would probably be better. But, you know, we just messed up and we're just going to have to live with that. So, yeah, so we've got this cooling area here. This is going to take, again, a very long time. I don't want to have you just sit here and wait for that. So let's just pretend that that happened. We destroy the petroleum that's up here so we don't get any more dripping. Go ahead and close this. Okay, cool. You, we have gone ahead and we have cooled everything down. So, yay, hooray, go us. Now let's pretend that we've done that. Let's cool the petroleum down to maybe 400. Not super, super far. It'll take way too long if we do any further than that. So cool, we have now have 400 degree petroleum. It's going to be instantly heated up by these steel tiles again, but still it's going to be cool enough for us to open the door down in the next chamber. So there we go. And now by the time we have moved crude oil, basically from here, it's gone through a couple processes. Now it's ready to be pumped out by our steel pump and it's not going to break the pump because it's sitting at this nice cool, cool, yeah, 400-ish degree petroleum somewhere in there. Definitely not anywhere close to breaking our steel pump. So that's a very long and complicated way to turn crude oil into petroleum at a better exchange rate while generating a little bit of electricity on it rather than having to pay electricity to do that uh, with the help of some magma. So yeah, interesting stuff there. Definitely something you can do, but again, not super practical, especially if it's one of your first times playing or if your objective is merely just to finish the game. This is absolutely not necessary, but it is there and it is neat. Definitely better for like some mega bases and stuff like that. So speaking of which, we talked a little bit about petroleum and I talked a little bit about how you don't want to overheat it because it can turn into, sa into sour gas. So let's just go ahead and break all those rules and let's do that anyway. So let's start with some crude oil. Let's turn this into some sour gas. So I don't have this all set up exactly that same way because I'm going to be very hand wavy. I'm not even going to try to attempt to make a setup for this because this is something that can get very complicated and I just frankly have not invested the time or energy into finding the most efficient solution so I'm not going to advertise that here. I'm just going to advertise the general concept and if you want to look up solutions for yourself or come up with your own solutions then go for it. But the basic idea is we're going to turn this uh, crude oil into way more energy than it would actually represent on its own and I'll show you how. So what we're going to do so we're just going to set some stuff up here to heat up this crude oil. Let's go ahead and sample this magma. Let's brush it in here. And yes, I'm being very hand wavy about this. I'm just going to go ahead and erase some of this when we get it to what we want it to be. So we've got some magma here. It's going to go ahead and heat up these steel tiles and heat up this oil. So this may not look like a big deal, but this is a lot of oil. Um, if you were able to find something like this, this could represent a lot of energy on its own by turning it into petroleum. It's going to be worth way more energy via something else, though. So let's, uh, let's try to accelerate this a little bit. Let's actually paint in some magma that's ridiculously hot. Let's do like, uh, I don't know, see how high this can go. Yeah, there we go. Fill. Whoa, it just melted our steel. Okay, that was a bad idea. But anyway... Uh, what we're going to be left out of this, this should all separate anyway. What we're going to be left out of this is we're eventually going to boil all this into sour gas. Um, all the magma looks like it is hardened, so that's kind of an interesting <laughs> development. <laughs> Probably shouldn't have done that. But uh, yeah, definitely didn't think about melting that. We have rock gas in here. That's pretty crazy. Uh, okay, let's, <laughs> let's not do that. How about that? Let's vacuum all this out. Let's redo this. I should tag this chapter as a totally failed example 
uh, and just move on. But yeah, so let's see how hot we can actually get this without melting everything, which we should not have done. So we go ahead and clear the floor. There we go. Fill with vacuum. I have never seen that happen before. So probably shouldn't do that again. Okay, so let's go ahead and set this up again. Set this up with metal tiles. When does this melt? Let's go ahead and find out. 4,400. So let's create some magma that is not that hot. Let's do 4,000 degrees. There we go. And let's go ahead and brush in some crude oil. Let's get it pretty close to its boiling point, too, so we don't have to wait for so long. 700 degrees Fahrenheit. So what's going to happen is I'm going to put this in here. There's going to be a good amount of crude oil. It's going to turn into petroleum, which you would have seen before. And this time we're going to overheat it to the point to where it gets sat to, into sour gas. And this is on purpose. Uh, sometimes you might see this down in the oil biomes every once in a while and be like, oh, sour gas, I can't do anything with that. But the reality is that uh, you can do something with that. It's actually extremely powerful. This is going to take a really long time to turn this all into sour gas. So what I'm going to do here is let's go ahead and vacuum uh, out what we produced. Let's sample this. 740 kilograms. So we're going to turn this all into sour gas right away. 740. There we go. And this boils off to sour gas at about 1,000, 1,100 degrees-ish, something like that. So let's go ahead and do that. So fill this with sour gas. So now because of this operation, we have a whole bunch of sour gas in this chamber that was just all derived from crude oil originally. Went from crude oil to petroleum to sour gas. Now that we have it at this temperature, let's see what else we can do with this. So if you look at the sour gas in the database, oh, the only other state we can change this to is liquid methane at minus 258. Hmm. Okay, then. Let's give that a try. Let's destroy all this. Let's destroy our tiles. I'm trying to maintain the exact same amount of sour gas. So you can actually see the transition here. Now let's go ahead and brush in something else that we could make, which is super coolant. And this is, again, going to be one of the reasons why this is not super practical, because super coolant is very hard to come by, especially in this quantity. Let's make this ridiculously cold, like minus 400 degrees. Let's go ahead and just brush this in. So let's say we have some super coolant in here. There's a bunch of sour gas on the other side. We're just going to cool this down really, really fast. Super coolant is definitely going to be imparting its energy on here pretty quickly. So sour gas temperature is dropping from 1,000 quickly down into the hundreds, and it will eventually cross down into where we need it to go. So we're just going to keep going with that. As soon as that gets there, it'll be pretty interesting as we just sit here and watch. So once it gets there, it should condense. It'll condense down into that liquid methane that we saw before. Still is very hot up here, by the way. And what we're eventually going to get out of this is, I, I don't want to spoil the surprise too much, but we're going to go into liquid methane. What happens if we heat this up a little bit more is we get natural gas out of this. So we have effectively walked a chain in which we have turned oil all the way into natural gas. So, and the reason that this is interesting is because this quantity of natural gas is absurd compared to what you would normally have. So, what you'd typically get, you would have a much more efficient setup than this. So, this is once again not going to be a setup that I'm going to advertise as like the be all end all of setups, but uh, this is just to demonstrate the concept. So, let's just go ahead and, and fudge this a little bit. We're at a pressure of about 165 kilograms per tile of natural gas. So let's go ahead and just uh, pretend this all converted. By the way, you will get a little bit of a side effect. You will produce uh, some sulfur in here. So that is definitely a thing as well. So it won't be a one-to-one -one conversion rate, but you will eventually have a whole bunch of this natural gas in here. Let's say at 150 kilograms per tile at maybe like 250 degrees Fahrenheit uh, below zero. Uh, we want natural gas, not sour gas. Negative 250 and 150-ish. So let's say you have all this natural gas. Now this is can be useful. You can use this for cooling. Uh, you could use this as a part of a setup to condense your natural gas or your sour gas earlier. But the interesting thing about this is if you remember back to my natural gas setup, we had a chamber of natural gas that would store natural gas. It was about maybe this big. And the most pressure that we would get in here is something like 20 kilograms per tile. 
And that's pretty common. So let's say we had this at maybe like 300 degrees Fahrenheit, whatever. So this is what we would normally have in a real base. However, we now have like seven or eight times that amount in this other chamber just from going through this process. And this is extremely valuable because natural gas is one of the most efficient ways to produce power in general. So if you have something like this, and you could also use it for cooling, you could use it for a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, if you have something like this, this is an insane amount of energy. And it all started from a pocket of oil that was a little bit bigger than just this room, which you could easily find on the map somewhere. So again, I'm not advertising a build for this. I'm not advertising anything other than the, the fact that this exists in the game. This is not necessary for you to win the game, but it is interesting and it is cool. Can be used for a lot of mega base setups or if you want to do some silly stuff or just see how much power you can produce. This is one of the things you can definitely do. So definitely something to keep in mind. Let me go ahead and destroy a bunch of this stuff. There we go. Okay, that was rocky, but we got through it. Uh, sure. So let's talk about one last set of things before we look at our main base. The last set of things I'm going to talk about is lumber and arbor trees and stuff like that and what you can do with that. You may have noticed if you look in the power setup, one of the first options to generate power from is a wood burner. Um, I'm again going to talk about why people use this or why they don't use this. Um, this is not something I've seen advertised very much at all. Uh, this seems much more like a gimmick idea. Even on maps in which lumber is very plentiful, I still find it more useful to burn coal or to stay on, on manual generators up until you can get into natural gas. A um, couple reasons why. So. I'm going to demonstrate why you wouldn't do this, and I'm going to also demonstrate what this could potentially be useful for. So if you look at this on this wood burner, the amount of energy this thing puts out is only 300 watts. Uh, this is pretty pathetic because manual generators put out 400. So this is pretty awful in terms of actually producing a good amount of power. It's worse than the first power source you're going to have in the game. So it's not typically something you're going to scale into. So that's why not a lot of people use it. Also, uh, lumber is not exactly cheap to grow yourself. You still want to grow it naturally, which is why I have stuff set up here like this, which we'll get to. But also the second reason uh, that you, or sorry, the reason why you may want to do it is because you can turn lumber into electricity, even though it's not great. We can also produce a lot of carbon dioxide. And most of the time when I talk about carbon dioxide, it's basically just like, ah, yeah, whatever, just blow it into space and call it good. But this can also be turned into oil by virtue of these guys. Let's look at these slicksters. So if you have these slicksters, uh, oh, that's, what just happened? I spawned an arbor acorn when I meant to spawn this. Okay, there we go. So if you spawn a slickster, these guys will eat carbon dioxide and they will put out crude oil. So in a very roundabout way, this is sort of an oil source, all starting from trees that you could potentially grow for free. So that could be a reason why you would do it. Um, I have never needed to do something like this. This is, again, another one of those gimmicky type of ideas. But yeah, let's just see how this would work. So one thing you want to do is you have the, uh, these arbor acorns. You want to try to plant these into natural tiles, and that's only because they're so expensive to maintain otherwise. So what I would do, so I would have a bunch of arbor acorns in a room like this. There's a better way to plant this. I'm being very hand, wave, hand wavy about it. But what I would do is if I was trying to be as efficient as possible, I would plan it in the way that's supposed to be like the best way to do it. Just look that up if you want to know how. But in general, you're just going to drop a... Oh man, what am I doing? Not these. I want pips. There we go. What you would do is you would spawn a whole bunch of pips. And these pips would eventually want to plant these acorns uh, in these natural tiles. So they will eventually do this. They will eventually create arbor trees. And the arbor trees will go for, grow for free if you do it this way. Um, there are also ways to make these natural tiles, if you want to look that up as well. I think it has something to do with like building a door in an enclosed space and then deconstructing the door and it turns into a natural tile. It's pretty weird, uh, kind of hacky, but yeah, it's there. What these arbor trees will eventually produce is lumber, which is why this all works. So let's go ahead and look that up. There we go. And not spawn another slickster. So let's say we have a whole bunch of lumber on the ground from these trees. And yep, there you go. Got a bunch of piles of lumber. Let's go ahead and ask for the lumber to be shipped. And then we'll just ship it down to our setup down here and you will see how fast this fills up with carbon dioxide. It is pretty hilarious. We also have a conveyor shut off so that everything on this line will come down into this room. So we're gonna go ahead and drop in the lumber. Lumber is gonna get loaded into these uh, generators, which is really bad. I mean, these things are 
They're as crappy as they look. Oh, this is not a lot of not a lot of lumber. I'm only spawning like one at a time, so that is not very fortunate. Uh, let's try to spawn as many as we can. There we go. So we're generating a little bit of power. It's uh, pretty bad. Uh, there's obviously not a lot, not a ton of lumber in these guys, but they still are producing something. But the carbon dioxide is already starting to fill up in here quite a bit. Um, just for context. I think a dupe produces like three grams per second. So this is insane amount of carbon dioxide. If you really wanted to produce it this way, this is definitely an option. Um, just to fill up your slickster terrariums and just to produce as much oil as possible without having to hook it up to the more natural source, or so the more commonly occurring sources. This could also be an option if you happen to spawn on a map for whatever reason, maybe it was like a mod that didn't have oil on it. And you do need oil to actually finish the game because you need to launch some missions with petroleum. So this is an option. It's not great, but it's there. Yeah, okay, whatever. Let's talk about another thing you can do with lumber, and that is to turn it into ethanol. And ethanol is useful because you can actually send it into petroleum generators and get energy that way, which is a very efficient, much more efficient in terms of power usage for your lumber. So let's go ahead and do the same thing. Spawn a whole bunch of lumber. Let's click really fast so we can get as much lumber out there as possible. All right, there we go. I guess we could have just done it in this chamber, but whatever. Oh, I need to turn this off. Oh, no. But yeah, uh, so it's eventually going to get shipped into here. I'll just spawn some in here, too, so we don't have to wait. But basics are that you'll have these ethanol distillers in here as I continue to click like a madman. You'll have ethanol distillers in here, and the whole point of these things is to turn these into ethanol, into lumber. Eth lumber into ethanol, obviously, so... What they will produce out of this is they will produce carbon dioxide, which is, again, an insane amount. Almost as much as the uh, wood burners, so you are still getting a hefty dose of carbon dioxide, which, again, is one of the reasons why you wouldn't do it. It does put out polluted dirt, though, and that's kind of good, depending on what you're doing. Not a lot of polluted dirt, but it definitely is there. The ethanol will come out here, though, and you can then feed it straight into your generators. Um, these generators will still produce a good amount of electricity off of the ethanol. Um, and yeah, it works just the same way as the petroleum we saw earlier. They'll still produce polluted water. So this can be a little bit of a source of polluted water if you wanted to turn lumber back into that. So there are definitely a handful of options you can do with this stuff, which I don't know why I have this set this way. We need to set our numbers on our smart batteries. How dare I? But yeah, that's, that's pretty much the idea. I don't know why these pips are not planning things for me. They are definitely rebelling. But that's the idea with lumber. Um, again... Not the most practical thing. Takes up a lot of space. Takes up a lot of time and energy maintaining or babysitting these pips and babysitting other things. Um, there are uses for it. Power being kind of one of them, but it can be used for other things as well. So yeah, those are the miscellaneous things that I have to talk about power. And that's pretty much it. Oh. Yeah, I forgot about this part. Let's talk about this part. <laughs> this part is going to talk about power control stations. Um... This is something you're just going to have to make a judgment call for yourself as far as what you want to do with it. I don't typically do anything with it because refined metal is typically very precious on a lot of my runs. But if you happen to get into volcanoes and you have a decent amount of volcanoes that are producing refined metals for you, this can be a decent option to increase your power output. Let's talk about this a little bit. So these things uh, will take any kind of uh, refined metal. Let's go ahead and spawn some in there real quick. Copper. Let's dig this out. And now, uh, you can go ahead and say, what the? I don't know why it doesn't want this. Maybe because there's not a dupe there, it doesn't think it's accessible. So let's go ahead and drop a duplicate in here. There we go. Yep, so we want to have copper here. Now, you're going to need to send copper to this every once in a while, and you will need a dupe that actually has the skill for it. So let's go ahead and give Max the skills that he needs. You need this electrical engineering, which is just the second level of operating, so let's go ahead and get that for him. And once that's in there, he'll be able to produce these little microchips. Oh, he's falling asleep! Alright, we're changing your schedule, Max. You're working night shift tonight. No sleep for you. Yeah, wake up. So what's going to happen is just they're going to produce these little microchips. And anything that's inside this room, which uh, the room requirements are as follows. You can see it here. It needs to be in a certain size. Uh, it needs to have the uh, the power control station inside it. 
but anything that's inside this room is now eligible to have a microchip attached to it. And what this microchip is going to do is it's going to make this thing produce 50% more power for the exact same amount of resources that you're putting into it. You, this is basically a way to turn refined metal into power. Um, and some of the better uses for it are things on like natural gas. You can hook it up to your petroleum generators if you want to, just to get that extra power. But once Mac starts adding it to these other things, let's go ahead and run a cable here really quickly so this stops complaining. Once Mac starts adding it to these other things, you will see that their power output grows beyond where it was before. So they start at 800, he applies the microchip and adds the, uh, adds the necessary welding that's needed to get that microchip in there. And as soon as he's done, which will take a little while, let's go ahead and fast forward this. As soon as he's done, you'll see this actually producing a peak of 1200 watts instead of 800. So you're basically using this metal to just generate more electricity for the same amount of resources. Max, you are really slow. It is making this very awkward. Let's go ahead and start pumping this in here just so we can kind of see this in action. Max, hurry up. You're so awkward. Oh, I guess I needed to build something to actually catch this, but... Whatever. Whatever, Max. Alright, finally, we got this thing done. And now that you can check out its output, it's at 1200 watts. So the next time these things need to turn on, which we'll just go ahead and deconstruct this battery and then rebuild it. Next, thing, next time these things turn on, uh, you will see this actually producing 50% more power than the ones that are around it. So you can see it's putting out 1.2 kilowatts. These ones are only putting out 800. So pretty straightforward usage. Uh, I don't typically use this very often because I'd rather have the dupe time spent somewhere else. Um, but it is, it's viable. Like you could always add it, nothing, no harm to it. You do have the overhead of needing to take refined metal to it. You do have an expensive refined metal now. It does take a dupe a fair amount of time to babysit this, but it has its uses. Uh, I've definitely put it in the miscellaneous section for a reason though. It's, that's because not a lot of people do use this and I definitely don't use it very often, so. Oh, let's all take a look at the duration, and if you have made it through this entire video to this point, then you are extremely dedicated. There is one more section left in this video, and that is going to be about real examples that you will see in a real base. I'll talk about some of my more basic uh, setups for all of my power systems in a real base that eventually enabled me to winning the game by launching the final rocket to the temporal tear. So let's jump into that really quickly, and we'll call this monster good. All right, my friends, you know when you're on a road trip and it's been like three days and you're just excited to finally get there because you're just right around the corner and you got to power through that last little bit? That's where we are now because we're almost done with this. Let's just take a look through the walkthrough base to look at some power examples that I had in a real run in which I was helping new players kind of learn the game and taking them through every step that you would need until you eventually finish it. So. Let's just peruse around a little bit in no sort of structured fashion to see what the power setups are that I have right now. So, first of all, the most basic one that's still standing is not my manual generators. I got rid of those a long time ago. It's these coal ones, so I have these coal uh, generators set up. They're being loaded by auto sweepers. Looks like their settings on here are AD20, so my defaults. And uh, the hatches that are actually feeding this are these guys right here. So I have these guys dropping out coal every once in a while. It's getting shipped back to where it needs to go. So yeah, pretty straightforward coal setup there. Natural gas setup is usually what you will get next. I've got four of these generators that's set up to 80-40 because I kind of want to use this a little bit more aggressively. Here's my natural gas reserves like I talked about in the previous section of having about 20 kilograms of natural gas stored up is pretty common, meaning that you have a good amount that's set aside for any sort of emergency power uses or something like that. This map also has a lot of natural gas geysers. So there's two here, and there's two over here. So there's a lot of natural gas being produced on this map. Definitely a lot more than is common uh, for a typical map. So you will more than likely find anywhere between one and three, way more often than you will ever find four. Uh, four is a lot. Might be the most I've ever seen. So that's what we've got going on for this. Petroleum generators, we've got a couple of those. These are kind of like my emergency power. Wait, this is for my hydrogen. This is for my petroleum. I have a 50 and 5, so this is really low. Um, this is just being used in the case of emergencies. You can see I have this backup tank of petroleum up here that isn't walled in. I probably should have, but it's not putting off too much. This room is also freezing cold because of the cooling that I have going in here, so there's really a big problem. 
Uh, like I mentioned before, in some of the builds, especially in the advanced section, once you get all these big buildings up that are producing a lot of heat and uh, stuff like that, then you're going to need some cooling behind it, and I definitely have cooling in this room. That's why this room is sitting at that, like, chilly 50 degrees-ish area. You can see this in Celsius. This is like, if you're a Canadian, it's like a summer day or something like that. <laughs> I know it gets hotter than that. All right, so we've got that for petroleum. Um, let's peruse around to our other ones that we usually have. Let's look, take a look at the steam power. So here's a volcano that I have captured, producing a little bit of steam power off of it every once in a while. Uh, it's going to erupt here in just a little bit, so we could maybe watch that if we remember to get back to it in time. So we've got a volcano there. Uh, there's a couple other volcanoes that are mostly for harvesting um, the actual metal out of them, but you will get a little bit of power off of those, so I have some power being generated off this gold volcano. Thought there was one somewhere around here. Maybe I never captured in this run. I think it's this. Yeah, here we go. We had another one that I could have captured, but I just didn't. Just because this was more of an example. I have way more power than I need in this run, by the way. So this is definitely demonstrating that if you capture all these things, then you'll have more than you need. Uh, here's our hydrogen setup. So this looks almost identical to what it was in the example. Um, hydrogen just being cooled by steam and steam turbines. Pumped out into a room. Pump back in. I have it going through a filter here. Um, I can't remember why I didn't put this on the other one. That's obviously a lot better for power consumption like we talked about. Uh, I probably should have done that. I don't remember why I didn't. Oh well. Whatever. We've got our hydrogen set up here. It looks pretty much the same. Is this going to erupt? Okay, we're getting pretty close. There's also another volcano up here, by the way. Um, I want to say... Oh no, I'm getting this mixed up with another base. I've seen too many bases lately. But yeah, so those are the major sources so far. We could look at the oil area down here. This was an example of being in the oil area and never needing to actually take one of the wells. This is all natural oil that's just sat on the map. So when I said earlier, there have been runs where I have not ever needed to harvest oil from any source other than just the natural oil that I found. This is definitely one of them. You can see there is some sour gas in here. There is some petroleum, but yeah, there's plenty of oil to go around down at the bottom of this map. I want to watch this volcano erupt, and I'm just going to keep checking back until it actually happens. But yeah, uh, by the way, I did have a leaky oil fissure in this one. Decided just to use it to generate a little bit of energy and cool it before I dumped it into that other room. Uh, this is not producing a crazy amount, and I'm not not—I'm obviously not uh, turning this into petroleum via the build we just saw in the last section. Only because I just didn't see it to be very practical here. If I were to get any magma from anywhere, it would either be from this volcano, or it would be from like the bottom of the map down here. You will note that I did not actually hook up anything to the magma down here, even though I did mention it just a little bit in this run. Also demonstrates that you don't have to go that crazy with it too, because our power needs for everything that we have, including transit tubes, which are horrifically expensive, we are more than fine with what we have right now, which is just some volcanoes, hydrogen vent, uh, the typical stuff. Here's some solar panels like we talked about. I usually do the regolith crushing method that I mentioned in the advanced section, so only have a handful of solar panels, and again, I'm not stacking them like crazy. I'm just using the base space here, only because it does take a lot of glass to get that up. And I was just feeling kind of lazy, but also, once again, this is more than enough power that I need for all the silly stuff that I'm doing in my base. This also, well, all my stuff is melted from launching the last rocket. This also includes a bunch of aqua tuners, all kinds of crazy stuff in here. Uh, that's going to be consuming a lot of energy, so you definitely don't need absurd amounts of power to, to finish a run. Is this volcano erupted yet? When's this going to happen? 0.2 cycles. I really want to watch this. And that's the last thing we're waiting for. I think we've covered pretty much every uh, power source other than manual and wood and uh, stuff like that, so not going to worry too much about anything else. I guess the other thing you could mention is that if you have steam turbines that are ever cooling something, that sort of is a power source, in the sense that you're getting power off of it, but you're also spending power to heat it up. So it's better than nothing, I suppose. Nothing too crazy there. Okay, last thing. Let's just watch this volcano erupt so we can eventually see all these things turn on and kick into gear. And then that'll pretty much wrap it up. Uh, while this is going on, I'm just going to go ahead and mention the uh, what's going to be going on on this channel in the near future. Um, I don't think I mentioned it, but I recently did move, and that's why I had a big gap in activity on this channel. There we go, it's emitting magma and instantly turning into hardened uh, igneous rock. But I did move, and I have been inactive for a little while. Uh, part of this move is also going to involve me getting a new PC. So for those of you looking out for 
the pointless challenges videos. Um, I'm going to start those back up here as soon as I get that PC built. Um, for two reasons. One, it's kind of a clean breakpoint to transfer everything over to a new machine. Uh, but secondly, also, that machine is going to be more powerful. So hopefully we will get a little bit better performance out of those runs than the ones we had before. So look out for those. Um, there is hints of alpha builds for the DLC for this. So if uh, there's a demand for that, I will go ahead and start signing up for those alpha playtests and start putting out content for that. But I've hesitated just a little bit only because I've been so busy with moving and because um, there have been other things going on. And I'm typically like an educational type of channel. My primarily, I'm not going to be very useful in the first like week of an alpha build. A lot of mechanics are going to be missing, so I may just wait until uh, the full DLC comes out or maybe do some beta testing if they do allow me into something like that. So. Yeah, that's just what to expect on this channel, and we can see our steam turbines at full power now, by the way, now that this volcano has erupted, and they'll stay that way for a little while, so pretty decent energy source. It can definitely help you save up on some of the other gases you might be storing, like your natural gas, your hydrogen, or something like that. But yeah, so that's pretty much all I have for, t for power. Um, I wish I could say, wow, look at how long this is, which I've mentioned this a few times. This is probably going to be by far the longest video I'm ever going to put out, so... Um, I wish I had some way to just mail somebody like a cookie if they got this far. I would definitely bake all of you cookies that watch the entire video. So uh, that's not really a practical thing, but if I could, then I would. So thank you very much for watching, and thank you very much for sticking through this. Please leave any comments if you have any questions or suggestions about future content. Uh, this was all started off of somebody talking about the fact that they didn't know some specific thing about power. I think it was the cabling. So I just made this entire tutorial because of that. So if you have anything that you want to see here, definitely let me know. And I will always prioritize requests over whatever I normally have scheduled. So yeah, hit me up in the comments if you have anything to suggest. Um, thanks again for watching. I'll see you guys in more Pointless Challenges and other tutorial videos really soon. So take care.